Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. So what I wanted to do here is have a discussion about Marvel's first black superhero, the Blue Marvel, Adam Brashear. However, before we get into this video, I want to let people know ahead of time that some of the phrases used in this story to describe African Americans and other non-white cultures may be considered a little offensive. And while the intention is not to be malicious, I'm keeping these phrases in this video as they serve to establish the significance of both the story itself, as well as the perception the world had of Blue Marvel and the way he viewed himself. So Adam Brashear was created by Kevin Graveau, who was also the mastermind behind both the Underworld and I Frankenstein series, as well as a writer for Superman, Batman, and others. In an interview with The Source, a digital and print media hub for news relating to urban music, African American issues, youth culture, and politics, Graveau had stated that the character of Adam Brashear was as much a reflection of himself as he was a wholly new character for Marvel Comics. What I mean here is that as a graduate of Howard University, Kevin Graveau's portfolio consists of a stint as a football player as well as a bachelor's degree in microbiology with minors in chemistry and psychology in addition to a master's in genetic engineering. Furthermore, as an African American born in 1962 and growing up during the early days of the civil rights movement, in his youth, Kevin Graveau experienced racism from various directions and as such, folded these concepts over into his writing of the Blue Marvel character. In addition to this, during the same interview, the question was asked about his view of diversity in comics regarding superheroes of color created by writers of color. In his answer, Graveau had stated that to him, while there were multiple black artists, there were very few writers who are black. While he acknowledged that this isn't necessarily indicative of a systematic issue of racism, the problem arises when writers create content based on their own personal experiences. As a result, the most prominent black superheroes in Marvel Comics in particular are Sam Wilson, Black Panther, and Storm, only one of whom could be considered a wildly powerful being. In an effort to rectify this, Graveau had sought to create a black superhero that, as he put it, could sit at the table of Superman, Martian Manhunter, Shazam, and the Century, and hold his own as a character that could rise to almost any occasion and save the world, but also had a level of intelligence that could rival Marvel's smartest beings, including Reed Richards, Tony Stark, and Amadeus Cho. As a result, in November of 2008, he released a semi-period five-part miniseries titled The Legend of Blue Marvel, which took a page from Paul Jingas and Jay Lee's The Century, and introduce Adam Brashear as a superhero who existed prior to the dawn of characters like Black Panther, Spider-Man, and the X-Men, but left the scene due to the culture of racism in the United States during the early 1960s. Having said that, The Legend of Blue Marvel bounces back and forth between the 1960s and the events immediately following Civil War and the death of Captain America in that during this time, Tony Stark is director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Carol Danvers leads the Avengers branch off team called the Mighty Avengers, and the roster of the main Avengers team itself consists of the Sentry Robert Reynolds, Tony Stark, Ares the Greek God of War, Black Widow, Yellow Jacket Hank Pym, and She-Hulk. In the opening events of this story, the group is in the midst of a battle with a being named Anti-Man, someone who will be explored further in the story. But the significance of this battle is that it serves to set the stage for the coming events by establishing a kind of Blue Marvel is the only one who can save us idea and that the Avengers are being completely ravaged by Anti-Man. The Sentry, for example, is a being on par with the Hulk even in his angriest form, but against Anti-Man, he poses no true threat and is easily taken down. In addition to this, Ares is an Olympian and the son of Zeus and Hera with prodigious skill in battle. While his strength is less than both Thor and the Sentry, he along with She-Hulk, Carol Danvers, and everyone else is virtually useless here. And so with Iron Man demanding to know why the Anti-Man is here, both his motives and the first mention of Blue Marvel come when he responds that his purpose is to bring salvation to the planet Earth, and that not even Blue Marvel was able to stop him when the two had previously fought. And so as the battle comes to a close, the indication here is that Anti-Man was on a timetable with a limit to how long he could exist, or at the very least, fight under these conditions, which becomes apparent when he effectively dissolves and fades away. Now recovering from the battle, Graveau continues to tease us with the power of Blue Marvel when the Sentry comments on how powerful Anti-Man was, and that he has never experienced a being on such a scale. Furthermore, Tony Stark pulls the group together arguing that because such a being exists, the only way for them to defeat him is to understand who he is and where his power comes from. Now from here, we jump back to 1962 with our first depiction of Blue Marvel himself in a battle with the Anti-Man. Now the reasoning behind the Anti-Man's actions largely remain ambiguous here in that the statements between the two of them as they do battle indicate that Anti-Man intends a larger end of the world kind of scenario with Blue Marvel doing what he can to stop him. 
Furthermore, as he's depicted here, Blue Marvel has all the hallmarks of a traditional hero and that he refuses to give up in the midst of the battle, he does what he can to keep innocence protected and he also attempts to talk Anti-Man down from his rampage. However, as a true villain, Anti-Man is the antithesis of Blue Marvel and that he's unwavering from his goal of presumed genocide and has no regard for the lives of the innocent people around him. Now the reason I'm drawing your attention to this is that the way Kevin Graveau depicts Blue Marvel here is that he's not an anti-hero blurring the line between right and wrong and instead, he is by all standards of measurement, a genuine hero. And so the dichotomies between Blue Marvel and Anti-Man come to a head when we learn that according to Anti-Man, humanity is a victim of his own viciousness, callousness, and warmongering. While there are good individuals out there, in the mind of Anti-Man, all humans are the same and that if humanity won't correct the error of its own morality, then he intends to force them to by wiping them all out. Now all of this again comes to a head as the two battle with Blue Marvel coming out victorious, but the world also learning that he's a black man. At this point, Graveau begins to move the story away from the basic premise of superheroes battling one another to focusing on the fallout of America learning that the most powerful superhero in the world is an African American. Picking up with Robert McNamara, the real world Secretary of Defense under President John F. Kennedy during the 1960s, alongside President Kennedy himself and the rest of his defense cabinet, we're provided the background of Blue Marvel in that his name is Adam Brashear. He graduated at the top of his class from Cornell with a PhD in electrical engineering and theoretical physics, with McNamara even going so far as to state that he's not your average colored. From here, the focus switches to his power where we're told that his actions have saved the world on multiple occasions. In one instance, he knocked a meteor the size of Arkansas off its collision course with Earth. During the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, when the United States and Russia almost went to war over the placement of Soviet nuclear weapons in Cuba, as part of the U.S. naval blockade around Cuba, the USS Enterprise was damaged by a Russian submarine, at which point Blue Marvel carried the ship from the Atlantic back to its port in the Newport News shipyards. These escapades combined with the fact that he had prevented the premature detonation of the Polaris nuclear ballistics missile during the famous 1962 failure meant that as far as McNamara was concerned, as the Secretary of Defense, Adam Brashear represents a level of power they can't contain, and that if the fledgling civil rights movement were to rally him to their cause, the result would be a superpowered African American fighting against the government as opposed to fighting on behalf of it. And so what we do here is begin focusing on the backstory of the relationship between Adam Brashear and the Anti-Man by establishing that the two were friends at one point and that both served together in Korea during the Cold War. With Adam Brashear picked up by the Secret Service at the request of the President, on his way to the White House, he flashes back to his time during the war. At some point during his tour with the US Marines, enemy soldiers ambushed their platoon. During the attack, a man named Connor was injured and Adam had intervened, saving his life in the process and running off the enemy soldiers. Now transitioning back to the war room and President Kennedy, the view of Adam Brashear comes into play when one of the generals refers to him as a porch monkey. Now the racism that Bashir has experienced over the course of his life is further compounded on when it's revealed that during his time in Korea, he was subjected to the taunts of other soldiers due to the color of his skin. Now this in addition is compounded on when we learn that during the early 1960s with the United States on the cusp of social unrest as a result of the civil rights movement, in addition to the racism that he has experienced from white society, black society has also demonstrated a hatred towards him due to the fact that he will not ally himself with the civil rights movement and instead desires to remain a bipartisan hero protecting the world. Now what happens next is extremely important and effectively sets the stage for everything that comes later on. As the president who did more for minorities than any other president in history, Graveau incorporated this into the story by having Kennedy provide an impassioned speech and saying that society could have easily dealt with the racial issue sooner by introducing desegregation, eliminating Jim Crow laws, but that this was never done because the status quo was acceptable to white society. However, when a superpowered African American arrived on the scene with the power to not only force the hand of social change, but do so with humanity having no way to stop him, the attitude of white society shifted from acceptance of the status quo to fear that the status quo could be removed and there would be nothing they could do about it. And so seeing a race war looming on the horizon due to Blue Marvel's continued existence as a superhero on Earth, and because the president serves at the pleasure of the American people, Adam Brashear is called into the White House where President Kennedy speaks with him directly. Informing Brashear that his presence as a hero means a potential race war between those who want to keep things as they are and those who want change, Blue Marvel is asked to step down from his role as a superhero. And so while the question from Blue Marvel is how long this is supposed to last, 
The indication from President Kennedy is that after handing Adam Brashear the Congressional Medal of Freedom, that he's being asked to step down from his life as a superhero indefinitely. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end. I know it's a cliffhanger, but what we're going to do is we're going to pick up with the second half of this and we're going to get into the current events with Tony Stark's search of Blue Marvel and how it is he's able to bring him back and have him become a member of the superhero community again. With that being said, I will catch you guys later. Peace. So continuing our discussion on Marvel's first black superhero, following Adam Brashear stepping down from his role as the Blue Marvel at the request of the president, rather than jumping back and forth between the past and the current events, this section of the story instead focuses largely on the present day. Picking up with Tony Stark, Reed Richards, and Hank Pym, Kevin Graveau uses the Avengers' battle against Anti-Man to present a sense of urgency and that to them, they have never faced a being of such power before. With the Sentry counted as the strongest of their ranks but being dispatched readily and with minimal effort, the questions remain as to who the Anti-Man is, how he gained his power, and how to stop him. Furthermore, as Hank Pym mentions, during the battle, Anti-Man had referenced the Blue Marvel, and while Reed had picked up on this as well, his only knowledge of Adam was that he had acted as a superhero at some point during the 1960s. Now this is particularly important and the reason why is that as arguably the smartest person in the world, a title that fluctuates between himself and Doom, Reed has access to some of the best technology and a library of knowledge, but despite everything he knows, the concept of the Blue Marvel is ambiguous here and that to the best of Reed's knowledge, the Blue Marvel had died during a battle, but he doesn't recall any of his exploits. Now what this does is establish just how obscure the Blue Marvel is, as well as the fact that he had left the superhero scene long before the dawn of the Fantastic Four. Furthermore, Reed also provides us with some information on the power of Anti-Man and that according to his readings, the Anti-Man had been getting weaker towards the close of the fight and that his dissipation was due to completely running out of energy. Furthermore, Reed's analysis led him to the conclusion that the Anti-Man is composed or powered by antimatter itself. While Tony Stark rejects this idea, what Kevin Graveau does is provide us with a simplified version of the relationship between normal matter and antimatter. According to Reed, under normal circumstances, when antimatter and normal matter combine, the result is explosive with both objects being completely eliminated. However, because antiman is powered by antimatter as opposed to being made of it, antimatter works more like a battery that powers the antiman who in turn uses his connection to antimatter energy to achieve his incredible strength, invulnerability, and other powers. And so while Reed and Pym direct their efforts to locating the source of antiman's power, Tony Stark spends his time focusing on trying to bridge the gap between the time Blue Marvel disappeared and the current day. At this point, Graveau thickens the plot of the story, and if I can be honest here, for the rest of the issue, the events that transpire will serve to demonstrate how good of a writer Graveau truly is. With Tony Stark standing as the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., he currently has access to the database of all intelligence organizations around the world. However, during a search of the Blue Marvel, the only piece of information he can locate comes through a single KGB file which had previously been accessed and held by the NSA. However, when he tries to access the information, we learn that the file has been sealed and secured by executive order, something that can only be done by the President of the United States. With the revelation that this file contains something referred to as the Blue Marvel Protocols, once Stark muses to himself as to what the protocols are, he finds himself granted access to the information contained within. From here, we jump to Tony Stark meeting with Dum Dum Dugan. To sidetrack for a second, Dugan was one of the original Howling Commandos and served as Nick Fury's second-in-command during World War II. In addition to this, when Nick Fury was promoted to the position of Executive Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. following its creation during the early 1960s, Dugan had remained on board as one of Fury's most trusted agents. Now, the conversation between the two tells us that during the era of Blue Marvel, not only was S.H.I.E.L.D. active, but they were well aware of who Adam Brashear was and what he had done and his quest to protect the Earth. And while Stark questions Dugan regarding what he knows about Blue Marvel, Dugan's initial reaction is to tell Stark to leave it alone. Now while Stark believes that Dugan was part of the cover-up, the discussion between the two is based on information that we haven't received yet. But putting two and two together, the situation seems to have been that following Blue Marvel stepping down at the President's request, S.H.I.E.L.D. had been tasked with monitoring Brashear for reasons unknown. However, because S.H.I.E.L.D. existed outside the authority of any existing government during that time, Fury turned down the request of the President to monitor Brashear due to the fact that neither Fury nor any of his group agreed with the fact that Brashear had been blackballed. Now when the question is asked by Stark as to why Blue Marvel was asked to step down in the first place, Dugan reiterates the same concerns expressed by President Kennedy and that because the United States was in the midst of social turmoil regarding race relations, 
the United States government did not want to be stuck behind the eight ball with an extremely powerful being working against them and with no recourse of their own. Furthermore, as the conversation between the two begins to wrap up, the question is asked that with all the power that S.H.I.E.L.D. had, including the power to overrule any government in the world, why didn't they use that power to back Blue Marvel rather than letting the president send him off? Now where Dugan refuses to answer the question due to the fact that he fears his words will be twisted and he'll appear to be a racist, the answer to this question is that the purpose of S.H.I.E.L.D. is to monitor threats to the planet Earth, not to involve itself in the political entanglements of individual countries. And so because Tony Stark is so persistent about discovering what happened to Blue Marvel and whether or not he's still alive, Dugan defers him to a man named Kroots, the same general that referred to Blue Marvel as a porch monkey in our first video. And while Stark prepares to leave, Dugan warns him that traveling down this path may lead Stark to learning about things that he won't like. Now transitioning to a place called Church Falls, Virginia, a small community just outside of Arlington, we learn that after the battle between the Avengers and the Anti-Man was broadcast on television, Kroots had come to the conclusion that at some point, Stark would come looking for him in search of Blue Marvel. Now the conversation that takes place between the two is very important for a couple of reasons. The first is because Kroots will remove some of the mystery surrounding Blue Marvel and what it was that happened to him, but also because Graveau is going to use this exchange to highlight how the world has changed and the difference between how a majority of society used to think regarding African Americans and how they think now. From the perspective of Kroots, the issue of Adam Brashear was as much national as it was global. When World War II had ended and Europe was being carved up by both the United States and the Soviet Union, the Cold War came into fruition as the two nations attempted to expand their spheres of influence regarding capitalism and communism. As a result, while the second Red Scare only lasted between 1947 and 1957, the concern of communist ideology spreading to the United States was still very real. This combined with the belief that Adam Brashear could have been another extremist like Malcolm X, or an insurrectionist like Gabriel Prosser, a man who led a slave rebellion in the summer of 1800, meant that the government was backed into a corner believing that Brashear's actions could have brought ruin to the entire country had he turned against the United States. This sentiment was compounded on by men like Bolivar Trask, who used the efforts of Blue Marvel to further their own anti-mutant agenda by arguing that even if Brashear was not a mutant, while he existed prior to the formation of the X-Men, he was an indication that superpowered people were emerging. Because a government would be unable to control them, if superpowered people were to band together, they could topple the world's governments, and if they descend into civil war, they could destabilize the world's socio-economic environments. As a result, in addition to Blue Marvel being asked to step down by Kennedy, his actions led to the federal government launching Project Wide Awake, a joint effort by the Defense Department, the CIA, the National Security Council, all headed by Henry Peter Gyrick, which would go on to see the creation and implementation of Sentinels. And so in order to end the legacy of Blue Marvel, before being asked to step down by President Kennedy, he had called Blue Marvel in for a final mission which had been classified above top secret. At some point, the US government's early warning system had detected an alien presence heading toward the planet Earth. Calling Bashir in to deal with the alien, the primary goal was to assess and neutralize the threat, but the secondary goal was to put Bashir in a situation where he may have been killed in action. With Bashir and the alien engaging in battle, we learn that from the information gathered by SHIELD intelligence, the alien was a scout for an invading armada looking to either conquer or destroy the Earth. While the situation seemed evenly matched with Brashear on the ropes and possibly being killed by the alien during the battle, he was able to muster his power together and in turn destroy the alien. And so as Cruz concludes his story by telling Stark that this was the last time he had ever seen Brashear, Stark's response is that Brashear was the only person who had knowledge on who Anti-Man was and how to defeat him. But rather than being able to speak with Brashear and learn what he knew about Anti-Man, the government sent him on a suicide mission in an effort to maintain control of the United States. However, what Gravo does here is drop a massive bomb by having Kroots inform Stark that Blue Marvel's death was a ruse. In order to ensure that he wouldn't become a martyr by those who looked to capitalize on his legacy for their own ends, the meeting between President Kennedy and Blue Marvel was organized in secret with all other branches of the intelligence agencies being led to believe that Blue Marvel had died fighting the alien and protecting the Earth as well as providing a set of Blue Marvel protocols that were incomplete. Handing Tony Stark a complete set of protocols which contains all information on Adam Brashear, we pick up in Maryland with a woman named Candace Brashear. Revealing that Adam is still alive, Tony Stark asks Candace if her husband is available, but because it's Thursday, Candace informs Stark that her husband is a teacher and has a late class. Becoming frustrated over the fact that Stark is being ambiguous as to why they're pursuing Adam, Tony calls Candace by another name, Miss Fraser. While we're not initially told what the significance of this is, the reaction of Candace indicates that her current identity is a false one, something that's confirmed when Stark reveals that Candace's real name is Marlene Fraser, 
and establishes that she's an agent of the federal government. Informing her that he's read the complete Blue Marvel protocols and is aware that Adam Brashear is alive but does not know where he's located, as the story comes to a close, the events transition to the physics department of the University of Maryland as Adam concludes his class. Assigning a chapter on the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, a concept of quantum mechanics that deals with the contradiction of trajectory of matter and observation, Adam receives a call from his wife Candace advising him that S.H.I.E.L.D. is looking for him. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end, and I don't know about you guys, but I love this story so far, and I will catch you guys later. Peace. So getting into part three of our discussion on Adam Brashear, the story actually shifts its focus away from Tony Stark's search for Blue Marvel and focuses on Adam's life after he was asked to step down by President Kennedy. Picking up with a man named General Mason, who as far as I know exists only within the context of the story, the indication seems to be that in addition to asking Blue Marvel to step down, President Kennedy authorized the United States military to keep an eye on Blue Marvel to ensure that he did not become a credible threat to the United States. Now the reason why the United States military was chosen to do this is that if you recall our last video, we had talked about how S.H.I.E.L.D. was given the opportunity but ultimately turned it down due to the fact that neither Nick Fury nor any of his subordinates agreed with what had been done to Blue Marvel. Now something that's really interesting here is that Graveau does not depict the situation as the US military against Blue Marvel. Instead, he provides us with a real world scenario in that while those in the military are required to follow the orders handed down to them, not everyone agrees with what's going on. As some of the soldiers state, if the government is concerned about Blue Marvel, it would make more sense and be more appropriate to simply ask him to work for the government, especially considering the fact that he's done so much to protect the world. Bringing in a woman named Marlene Frazier, at the time of her first meeting with military intelligence, she's established as being relatively neutral with regards to Blue Marvel himself. Now this is something done intentionally by Kevin Graveau and we'll actually find out why later in this series. But the superior of Marlene is against the idea of sending her on her mission. Now in terms of his depiction, Graveau actually leaves it to us to decide if this man is racist or not and that he states that the culture of African Americans is different from that of whites. While this is a true statement, the context of the situation is ambiguous in that this man is not talking among his friends and nothing he's saying is explicitly racist in and of itself. But the result of the meeting is that Marlene is being tasked with engaging in a relationship with Blue Marvel for the purpose of monitoring him. Now at this point, we jump to the current day with Marlene's entire story being provided to Blue Marvel firsthand. Now the reaction of Blue Marvel during the conversation is exactly what we would expect in that he's basically learning that the entire marriage between himself and Marlene was rooted in deception. From the perspective of Adam, he was more like a personal project for Marlene rather than an actual love interest, something that's compounded on when she reveals that she had spent all of her time reading up on everything about Adam prior to meeting him for the first time. Where Marlene pleads her case in saying that at the time she was operating in the interest of her country, for Adam, all of this is irrelevant. The reason why is that in addition to learning that his marriage is a lie, after everything he had done for the United States and in the world, in the end, the government still didn't trust him. However, for Marlene, while her original intention was to prove her worth as a spy, as time progressed, she developed an actual love towards Adam. While some of this was due to the time they spent together, it was also due to the experiences the two of them shared as they encountered racism in public society. And so what Graveau is basically doing here is using the character of Marlene to reflect the part of society who were raised isolated from such intense racism and had no idea of how rooted it was in the rest of the United States. Because Adam consistently took the high road despite the fact that he could have obliterated any of the racist individuals he had encountered, Marlene's affections grew in that to her eyes, Adam was everything a man should be, in that he was honorable, intelligent, and compassionate. And so as time passed, contact was eventually severed between herself and her superior, allowing her to give herself completely to Adam and cast aside her mission. But for Adam, all of the information revealed here is more than he can bear, in that the personal struggles he endured required that he walk away from being a hero for Earth, but that despite it all, the one person that he could rely on was his wife. But after the revelation of her role in his life despite the affection she claimed to have developed over the years, in the end, Adam feels as isolated and alone as he did when he left the White House after being asked to step down. And so faced with the facts, Adam makes a decision to leave his wife due to her deception. And so picking up on the blue area of the moon, the story shifts its focus to the relationship between Blue Marvel and the Watcher. Now for me, this is probably one of the best moments of the story in that this discussion allows for an outpouring of Blue Marvel himself. 
With the Watcher arriving, his experiences monitoring the multiverse and all occupants within have provided him with valuable insight into the nature of people. As such, his argument here is that Marlene is only human and makes mistakes just like everyone else. Furthermore, Blue Marvel is talking out of anger here in that to him, he confided everything in Marlene. But because the Watcher sees and knows all, Blue Marvel's claim has a fault. As the Watcher forces him to admit, Adam only revealed to Marlene what she needed to know, and so in truth, his actions are really no different than hers. And so following this, between their discussion, the problem Blue Marvel faces is that on one hand, he has to deal with the fact that he has to return to his position as a hero in order to safeguard against the Anti-Man. But on the other hand, all he has known from society is mistrust and deceit, ranging from society itself to his wife. And so transitioning to the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier above New York, the conversation between Reed Richards and Tony Stark reveals that the Anti-Man has returned. Furthermore, the atmosphere is beginning to grow with antimatter energy, meaning that Anti-Man is growing stronger by feeding on its power. And so as the story begins to come to a close, Tony Stark is greeted by the arrival of Adam Brashear, who sought out Tony Stark in order to see if there was a way for him to help bring an end to the actions of Anti-Man. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end, and I will catch you guys later. Peace. So continuing our discussion on Blue Marvel, we pick back up with Adam Brashear during his first encounter with Tony Stark, Reed Richards, and Hank Pym, but we also get a little more insight into the history of his character and the answer to the question of how he gained his powers. And so the story initially opens with Adam Brashear in amphibious naval base Little Creek in North Carolina. Now something I'd like to point out here is that in real life, this naval base is actually in Norfolk, Virginia and deals with offensive naval operations and deploying soldiers overseas and into hostile shores. But the basis behind Graveau bringing us as part of the story is to focus on the history of Adam Brashear and Connor Sims, the Anti-Man. What we learn here is that contrary to previous depictions of white Americans in the story up to this point, not everyone was racist during Adam's time prior to becoming the Blue Marvel. In this instance, Adam was dealing with some racist members of the Navy, and where previously he would remain hands-off rather than facing dishonorable discharge for conduct unbecoming of an officer by way of fighting, he along with Connor Sims finally fought back and gave the soldiers a lesson in humility. Now transitioning to the present day, we join Adam Brashear alongside Tony Stark, Reed Richards, and Hank Pym aboard the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier above New York. Something I'd like to mention here is that where I'm normally straightforward on what I like and dislike about a section of a story in comics, in this instance, I'm actually on the fence here. The reason why is that with Adam Brashear arriving on board the helicarrier, Stark extends an olive branch of friendship to Brashear by offering a formal apology on behalf of the United States and that the president himself would like to formally welcome Blue Marvel back to the superhero landscape. However, Brashear doesn't really want to hear it, and where he states that his intention is to focus on the here and now by providing the group with his knowledge of Anti-Man, to be quite frank, I don't think this was the right road to take. Now, this is something that we'll get further into here in a second, but at the moment, the conversation shifts his focus to Anti-Man himself. According to Reed, the issue that they face is that Anti-Man is wildly powerful, more so than anyone that the Avengers have ever faced before. Now to be clear, this does not mean that the Anti-Man is the most powerful being in existence. Cosmic entities like Galactus and others are still far beyond anything that Anti-Man is capable of. It's simply that within the context of Earth-based villains, none of the Avengers have fought anyone like this before. Something else that Graveau does here is provide us with an understanding of just how intelligent Adam Brashear is and saying that he knows his way around a science lab but that he also knows the exact method in terms of how Anti-Man's powers work, and the reason for this comes in the form of Rashir's backstory. What we're told is that at some point during the careers of himself and Anti-Man, Connor Sims had become part of Army Intelligence while Rashir worked on a project involving harnessing the power of antimatter as a source of energy. While well, the military had intended to weaponize this power before it was released to the general public for other applications, at some point, and for reasons unknown, the experiment went awry, bathing both Adam Brashear and Connor Sims in antimatter energy. Where Sims was able to pull Brashear from the wreckage, Sims appeared to have succumbed to the energy and was completely obliterated. As a result, Connor Sims became the Anti-Man, while Brashear became the Blue Marvel. Now what Graveau is doing here is providing us with the basis behind Blue Marvel's power, but to be honest, he doesn't really do the best job explaining exactly what Brashear is capable of in clear and simple terms. Having said that, the best way to think of Blue Marvel is that he is a less powerful version of Franklin Richards. Where Franklin can manipulate all matter in existence regardless of whether it be normal matter or antimatter, 
Adam Brashear is powered by and can only manipulate antimatter. What this means is that if Brashear were to enter the negative zone, he would be godlike in terms of his ability to manipulate and control all things within that space. But within the normal universe, he's capable of incredible strength, speed, and durability, but also has enhanced senses and like. At the same time, the Anti-Man is the same way, but the best way I can explain his powers would be to say that he is an incomplete version of Blue Marvel. Anti-Man has all the same abilities as Brashear, but his control over them is not as acute, and his molecular structure is literally unstable. Now back to the conversation at hand regarding Brashear, Stark, Reed, and Pym, Hank's initial question is that if Brashear was watching the world unfold following the assassinations of Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., he had to notice that the world was improving. What Pym is basically saying here is that Brashear could have come back at any point in time and despite what he might say about having his choices limited, at the end of the day, at least some part of his isolation was voluntary. However, according to Brashear, his view is that the President of the United States had requested that he step down and that in his mind, defying a request from the President on that level would break the law. As the one thing that holds society together and keeps anarchy from reigning supreme, in the eyes of Brashear, maintaining the law is of the utmost importance. Now returning to our discussion on the attempt at Stark to apologize for his past actions of the United States and its rejection by Brashear, where Adam leaves to take care of personal matters, this concept is discussed further by Reed, Tony, and Pym. Where Hank doesn't seem to grasp why it is that Brashear takes the attitude that he does, Graveau establishes Reed as the voice of reason and does this by using the idea of mutants as an example of how prejudice still exists within the realm of Marvel Comics. What Reed tells us is that where the Avengers or the Fantastic Four operate to save the world, whenever they're successful in quelling a threat, they're lauded as heroes, but when the X-Men perform the same act, they're shunned by humanity. To Reed, prior to the birth of Franklin followed by Valeria, he had never had any reason to pay any attention to the affairs of mutants and the issues that they faced in society. However, because both his children are mutants with incredible powers by way of Franklin's ability to warp reality and Valeria's genius level intellect, the issues faced by mutants came into full swing. And so what Graveau is doing here is making an analogy by comparing the position of Reed before and after the birth of his children to the position of America following the advent of nationwide media. What I mean here is that during the time of regional news, the racial issues in the United States were only really known by intelligence organizations under the government and individuals residing in the areas whose issues were most prevalent. However, following the advent of nationwide news, families on one side of the country could see what was happening on the other side, and as a result, the totality of racism in the United States was thrown into view for the world to see, leading to a massive upheaval regarding how American citizens viewed the nation as a whole. Now picking back up with Bashir, we transition to his underwater fortress in the Mariana Trench within the Atlantic Ocean. As the largest cavern in the world and deep enough to house Mount Everest with room to spare, the trench was a perfect location for Blue Marvel's base of operations and that the only person who would have been able to access it would have been Namor the Submariner. Greeting his old friend, this particular moment is very important for several reasons. The first is that it goes towards establishing how long Brashear had operated as a superhero and that Namor had predated Brashear, but the two of them were extremely close friends. The second is that because the two were friends, this establishes that in the eyes of Namor, Brashear was an honorable man, which is something rarely found, and that Namor pretty much hates everyone else. What we're also told is that regarding his physical strength, Brashear is on par with both Thor and the Incredible Hulk, something that's stated by Namor in that when he and Brashear had first met, the two had fought one another due to Namor's belief that Brashear was simply invading his oceans. The final reason why the encounter between the two is so important is due to the fact that Namor actually assuages Brashear from abandoning the Avengers and leaving them to their own devices and attempting to defeat the Anti-Man. Where Brashear voices his irritation over the nature of politics and that he was previously asked to step down, but is now being asked to come back even after learning that he spent his whole life being monitored, Namor uses his experience fighting among the invaders to provide a measure of perspective. What Namor says here is that when he fought alongside Captain America, Bucky Barnes, and Jim Hammond during World War II, he was also fighting alongside what were referred to as Red Tails. Now the Red Tails was a nickname for pilots who painted the tails of their planes red, but the official name for this group was the Tuskegee Airmen. As African Americans fighting during World War II, the Tuskegee Airmen were a real world element in society, but because African Americans were looked down upon during this time, the Tuskegee Airmen were considered unintelligent and largely treated as cannon fodder. However, in the eyes of Namor, they were the true embodiment of bravery and that through it all, they never turned their backs on a fight, were always the first ones in, and the last ones out. Using this as a platform, Namor makes the case that regardless of the conflict faced by any one man, 
There's always a choice to be made regarding whether or not to act, and there will always be evil in the world. As a result, those with the power to confront that evil have a responsibility to do so, even if it flies in the face of everything that they believe, and this logic is based solely on the idea that should they not act, the evil of individuals in the world would reign supreme. And so taking the words of Namor to heart, Rashir dons his blue Marvel uniform with the intention of returning to Reed, Stark, and Pym, and ally himself in their efforts to defeat the Anti-Man. However, before he can achieve this, Connor makes his return to confront Adam for the first time since her last encounter in the 1960s. Now what Graveau does here is provide us with the final piece of the backstory between Sims and Brashear. What we learn here is that following the experiment that gave them their powers, Sims had somehow rematerialized after which he had been taken to Brashear's underwater facility. Where Sims initially greeted Brashear as a friend, Sims was informed that he had been in a coma for a month. Furthermore, after analyzing his molecular structure, Brashear came to the conclusion that Sims' molecules were essentially breaking down on the atomic level, meaning that he appeared to be dying. However, for Sims, the end of his existence as a normal human and rebirth through the power of antimatter made him mentally unstable and through his insanity, he had come to the conclusion that society's racism and prejudice needed to be eliminated to make way for a utopia of sorts, even if it required the destruction of all life. At the same time, where Bashir tries to reason with Sims and recalling some of the get-togethers that their families had shared with the two becoming godfather to the other's children, in the end, Sims came to the belief that Bashir had stolen his family away from him. However, Adam counters this by stating that the instability of Sims put not just society, but his own family in danger. As such, Bashir hid Sims' family away under the belief that he could reason with Sims and restore him to normalcy. Furthermore, Brashear tries to help Sims understand that the world isn't the way that it used to be, and while there will always be prejudice in the world as is human nature, the landscape of open racism is no longer an issue and that people are more acceptable than they were before. But despite all of this reasoning, in the end, Sims believes that Brashear's willingness to give society a chance to demonstrate the steps is taken towards acceptance is an inherent weakness, and that if Brashear has truly allied himself with humanity, then he's just as guilty as everyone else. And so as this issue comes to a close, Sims attacks Brashear, knocking him unconscious in the process, and uses the opportunity to continue his campaign against humanity and his goal of eliminating all life on the planet Earth. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end, and let me know what you guys think about this issue so far. And I will catch you guys later. Peace. So what I want to do here is have a discussion about the various cosmic entities of the all-new, all-different Marvel Prime universe, starting with Galactus. Now what I'm hoping is that at the end of all this, you'll have a strong understanding of his character relative to the number of issues that we have, as well as how his involvement in the new universe actually helps us to understand how things relate to the pre-Secret Wars universe. So the all-new, all-different Galactus comes to us as part of Al Ewing's all-new, all-different Ultimates. And while I will have a video on that team as part of the lead up to Civil War II, what Al Ewing does here is actually really interesting. To sidetrack for a second, when Galactus first debuted in the original Marvel Universe, while he wasn't provided an origin in his first few appearances, the explanation of his existence came by way of Thor Volume 1, issues 168 through 170. Originally established as being a universal explorer named Galen in the Earth Zero continuity, at the end of that universe's life, Galactus remained the sole survivor, merging with that reality's version of eternity. During this birthing process, Galactus had fashioned a vessel for himself, allowing an incubation period of several million years where he gathered his energies, constructed a suit to contain those energies, and emerged as a Galactus that we all know and love, consuming planets to sustain his life. Now while the reasons for Galactus being a cosmic necessity have changed over the years, ranging from a meta-commentary on his representation of life, death, and rebirth, as well as a physical force whose death unleashed Abraxas, who threatened the multiverse, on the whole, Al Ewing does not actually provide us with an expansive origin in the Marvel Prime Universe. While there are different explanations that could be offered for this, in truth, I would surmise that with Galactus being such a well-known character, even if his origin is only slightly understood by casual readers, it's still understood. And so the information provided actually just gives us a one-page synopsis sticking with the classic story of Galactus hailing from the Earth Zero continuity. That said, because the Ultimates exist to end threats to the universe, but to also boost fan anticipation for the start of the series, the first being encountered by the Ultimates came in the form of Galactus. Taking place in issues number 1 and number 2 in November and December of 2015 as the official launch title and a self-contained story, what we're told is that from the perspective of Blue Marvel and Black Panther, Galactus's hunger is not a requirement for him, 
Instead, this is a byproduct of the incubation period, meaning this process could be reversed. Now something to take note of here is that Al Ewing is taking certain liberties and that as far as I'm aware, the hunger of Galactus is an intrinsic part of his character and no one had ever created a story where his hunger was depicted as something that could be cured. The only exception to this that I can think of came in the first six issues of the 2003 Thanos solo series by Jim Starlin which depicted Galactus' hunger as a multiversal entity working through Galactus and attempting to consume realities. However, because this story arc stretched the limits of credulity even by comic standards, fans don't generally consider it to be canon or in existence. Now in terms of the Ultimates, after putting their efforts together, Black Panther and Blue Marvel reasoned that if Galactus' hunger emerged following his time in the incubation chamber, the hunger could be reversed by forcing Galactus back into the chamber. To this end, the Ultimates backtrack Galactus' time as a devourer of worlds, eventually arriving at Archaeopia, the first planet Galactus had consumed after emerging. Scavenging the dead world and reconstructing the incubation chamber, the entirety of the Ultimates including Carol Danvers, Monica Rambeau, America Chavez, and Black Panther combine their powers in an effort to force Galactus back into his chamber. Emerging as the life bringer at the conclusion of issue number two, Al Ewing established that instead of consuming worlds and ending life, Galactus now functions as the source of life, creating and healing worlds he had previously consumed, beginning with Archaeopia. Following this and going into the next five titles leading up to issue number seven as the most current release, the Ultimates line served to provide two plots, the first following the Ultimates themselves and leading into Civil War II, with the second following Galactus and an explanation of the all new all different Marvel Prime universe. Picking up in issue number four following the Ultimates attempts to understand the space-time continuum in the post-Secret Wars continuity, Galactus himself was contacted by Eternity who advised of the Ultimates actions and that they could not proceed. Visiting the team amidst their journey into the previous realm of the Beyonders which now exists as a void of nothingness, Al Ewing begins the first steps of referencing the pre-Secret Wars universe. Where Carol Danvers offers the explanation that the team sought to understand the space-time continuum, Galactus provides her with a glimpse of how he sees time, establishing that where Marvel had never officially provided an answer, the fact remains that Secret Wars was not a reboot. Instead, the events that took place in the Earth-616 universe still happened, but Secret Wars allowed for a reshuffling of characters and realities. This comes with the fact that as Galactus shows us, the death of the original Captain Marvel, the Iron Man Armor Wars, and the Onslaught Saga are memories that he still maintains. At the same time, he also makes reference to Marvel's sliding timescale and the idea of retcons. To sidetrack, with Marvel's publications, it was standard practice for them to include dates and references to presidents throughout the 1960s and 1970s, but with the 1980s seeing their final reference to a concrete period in the real world, from that point going forward, all absolute dates of reference were eliminated. What this meant was that instead of saying Civil War happened in a certain year and during a certain month, instead the event would take place with future stories referencing it as a year or three years ago. As a result, between 1984 and the current day, everything within Marvel Comics is assumed to have taken place within a 10 year window. In addition to this, Galactus states that the past is never concrete and that it can always be changed. Now this is really more of a meta commentary on retroactive continuities and the idea that various writers will alter the history of Marvel's past in order to suit an existing story or to introduce a character. As an example, within the Marvel Universe itself, Blue Marvel did not exist until 2009 when Kevin Graveau had created him and altered the history of Marvel to establish that Adam Brashear was Marvel's first black superhero. Now while I do have a video explaining these concepts in more detail for those who still find them a little confusing, with Galactus forcing the heroes to sleep and returning them to the main universe, He's called before Eternity, who reveals that he's being kept in chains and was placed in this position by an unknown being. Now, something I actually want to do here is I want to step away from this for a minute and I want to have a discussion on the role of Eternity in the new Marvel Prime Universe. Within the old universe, Eternity existed as a singular being and a physical manifestation of each universe that existed. However, because Doom had created Battle World during Secret Wars, while the planet was composed of different realities, Instead of Battleworld having a version of Eternity for each territory, the whole of Battleworld combined to allow for a singular entity who was kept under the control of Doom's power. Now this is particularly important due to the fact that the fan community was largely split over the idea of a multiversal version of Eternity existing under the Living Tribunal and serving to represent the multiverse itself, holding it all together. While the idea of a multiverse Eternity was alluded to but never really confirmed prior to and during Secret Wars, with Al Ewing's Ultimates, his information reveals that after the destruction of Battleworld and the creation of the multiverse, 
by Owen Reese, Franklin Richards, and Reed Richards, a multiversal eternity came into existence holding the multiverse together under the New Living Tribunal and spawning the cosmic entities. And so with the multiverse itself in chains, Galactus was tasked with discovering who it was that did this and how to restore things to normal. Picking up with issue number 6, where Galactus continues his quest as it was assigned by Eternity, during his travels, he encounters Master Order and Lord Chaos. As the representations of Order and Chaos who work against one another and maintain universal balance through their conflict, because Galactus had previously been known as the World Devourer, to the mind of Lord Chaos, Galactus represented destruction and catastrophe, but for Master Order, the destruction of Galactus was part of the Cosmic Order, allowing for the death of planets and the balance of the universal population. But because he has vacated that role and stepped into the position of the Lifebringer, Lord Chaos is no longer satisfied due to Galactus failing to inflict destruction, and Master Order is unsatisfied due to Galactus stepping away from the status quo. To this end, the entities transported Galactus to the Superflow which existed as a space between realities with the intention of forcing Galactus back into his position. However, because Master Order and Lord Chaos exist in such rigid forms with Galactus maintaining free will, the two entities are completely overpowered and forced to retreat, after which Galactus is brought before Owen Reese, the Molecule Man. Now for this bit of the discussion, while we have previously engaged in a bit of meta-commentary, the conversation between Galactus and Owen Reese is extremely important due to the fact that Molecule Man will actually address the reader base directly and the community's view of the all-new, all-different universe. While Molecule Man gets extremely wordy and goes as far as to use a modified version of the Schrodinger's Cat Thought Experiment, the long and short of this is that Molecule Man addresses the issue of Marvel existing in a state of flux. To sidetrack here, the thought experiment of Schrodinger's Cat is a concept in quantum mechanics offering the idea that if an unobserved action occurs, any and all possibilities of that action are available. However, once that observation occurs, an absolute answer is provided and the question is definitively answered. While this may seem a little confusing, to simplify things, Molecule Man is saying that the problem with the current universe is that it was rebooted, but it wasn't rebooted. Furthermore, there are some beings within the universe who do not remember the events of the multiversal collapse and secret wars, but there are also some who do. As a result, there are those who believed that the multiverse did collapse and was recreated, but there are also those that don't. What Al Ewing is doing here is offering a statement to us and Marvel saying that you can't have it both ways. You can't shuffle some characters around, introduce new teams, and offer conflicting memories, all while calling it a reboot if you haven't actually rebooted anything. Either it's a reboot, or it's not. What I want to do here is I want to talk about the Ultimates. More specifically, this second uh, storyline basically focuses on two aspects. It focuses on the return of Thanos, and it focuses on Galactus creating a new Herald. And so I'm, I'm still not sure which one of those titles I'm going to pick. <laughs> but the idea here is that, uh, for those of you guys who don't know with Marvel Comics, the Ultimates are like this, uh, this multiversal group. Uh, they're like the Avengers on a much grander scale. Now, the Ultimates don't exist in the multiverse. It's not like, you know, the members hail from different universes in the Marvel Multiverse. Uh, they all hail from the Earth-616 universe, but the idea behind this is to have them face threats from across the multiverse that threaten the main Marvel Earth-616 reality. The issue with this is that they're, they're as much a defensive measure as they are an exploratory team. And so the goal here is to, uh, to basically face off against threats that most people can't deal with. That's one of the reasons why we have such powerhouse characters. That's why we have Carol Danvers. That's why we have the intelligence of Black Panther. That's why we have Adam Brashear. We have Spectrum. We have America. America Chavez, we have some really, really powerful beings here. And the idea is that, again, they're designed to step up against multiversal threats. Now, we had talked in my video about the all new, all different Galactus that uh, their first task was to basically uh, eliminate the hunger of Galactus due to the fact that by Galactus traveling around the universe and consuming worlds, that he in and of himself was destructive. The issue with this is that Al Ewing, I, I imagine, would have in, in some form or fashion, whether he knew about it through a retcon or whether he simply just didn't know about it or didn't care, it begs the question, how do the Celestials fit into this? Because for those of you guys who don't know, in Marvel Comics, Celestials quite literally plant eggs in worlds, and they will emerge after some million years or however long it is, but Galactus running around and consuming worlds is just as much a safeguard for the universe as it is for him consuming his own hunger, because if he wasn't consuming worlds, then it would result in these uh, in Celestials running rampant throughout the cosmos. So the idea is, is to basically keep things from going insane. Now having said that, uh, because this second volume is 
is part of the Civil War II event. One of the interesting things about this is that the tie-ins, they're a little lackluster, but the, it's also a good way that Marvel has done it. Instead of tying them directly into Civil War II, which would mean that we would basically have to hold off all the volumes until Civil War II comes out. Instead, they basically just reference the events of Civil War II, but things are still going on in their individual stories. And so in truth, the Civil War II tie-ins are really standalone stories. You don't really have to read the main Civil War II story in order to read the, the second volume of all these different publications, X-23 and Avengers and so on and so forth. It can't hurt, you know, to read Civil War II as it goes on, but it's not a requirement. And so what Ultimates, what this second issue does, or I guess the second run does, is it initially picks up with a character called the Infinite. Now, we don't really know anything about this guy, but what Al Ewing does is he initially jumps back to 1998 with Adam Brashear working alongside his, uh, his son, Kevin. Now, Adam Brashear, of course, we know is a genius level scientist. Uh, his intelligence isn't necessarily up there with Black Panther, but he's not that far off. And so his son, Kevin, had very much followed his footsteps in terms of pursuing, you know, these paths of science. And uh, the result was that it seemed to be these, uh, these incursions or these many temporal wakes that resulted in some being trying to enter the Marvel Earth 616 continuity. And so because this had been going on for decades, Adam Brashear alongside his son had been working to try to prevent this from happening. Now, the other half of this though, is that Adam Brashear's son, Kevin, uh, had at one point vanished, which is one of the reasons why we hadn't seen him for so long during the early issues of his run in Marvel Comics with Mighty Avengers and so on and so forth. He was eventually brought back, but he wasn't, uh, he didn't quite operate in the same capacity that he did in this. But again, this is really just Al Ewing setting things up. But because of the fact that this ties into Civil War II, the main event itself focuses on a character named Ulysses, who is an inhuman with the ability to predict the future. Now, as we discussed in my Steve Rogers Captain America video, these predictions are not 100% accurate, but they're close enough that Carol Danvers is willing to gamble on the accuracy of these in order to basically stop crimes before they happen or to stop incidents before they happen. Now, because of the arrival of Ulysses, it's to turn the tables on how it is that Adam Brashear views these temporal rifts with regards to this infinite trying to come through. Where previously it seemed like it was a threat, instead, Adam Brashear begins to look at it as the very basis behind the Ultimates Charter in the sense that they're exploratory, they're investigators, they're problem solvers. And so where the initial idea here is that this machine is being developed with, with a combination of the Ultimates team as a whole in order to stop this danger, Adam Brashear realizes that it's actually to figure things out. And so what happens is that when this rift opens up, they basically reach out to this humanoid being, to the Infinaut, and they bring him in. And Adam Brashear states to everybody that the case with this is that he's basically just a scientist. He's a scientist from another universe that was exploring the multiverse, and the Ultimates can learn just as much from Infinaut as Infinaut can learn from them. And so because of this, it's really not a danger, but it falls in line with the ideology of the Ultimates in terms of looking at problems and trying to get them figured out, finding solutions. And so from here, we jump to Connor Sims. Now, for those of you guys who have seen my video on Adam Brashear's character with his first appearance, as it was written by Kevin Graveau, the experiment that gave Adam Brashear his powers also gave Connor Sims his powers. The difference here is that for all intents and purposes, when it comes to just sheer raw power, Connor Sims is pretty far beyond Adam Brashear. Connor Sims has the ability to manipulate uh, antimatter, which is the opposite of normal matter, but it still allows him the ability to manipulate atoms on a subatomic scale. And so uh, he's basically a character who can warp reality. The issue with this is that Connor Sims was eventually, or at least was initially believed to have been destroyed during Adam Brashear's first encounter, I guess uh, the, the story, the final encounter with him. But it wasn't until Al Ewing came back and wrote the Ultimates that he revealed that Connor Sims was alive. He was just out in space somewhere and no one knew about it. But Connor Sims himself didn't really know what was going on. Now, the reason seemed to be uh, based on the idea of Secret Wars when Reed Richards had restored the multiverse, that Connor Sims' memories were wiped. But then we learned that Connor Sims did remember everything. He remembered all the things that he had done, uh, but he had also come to a realization. And the realization he had come to was that eternity had been chained, that some cosmic force out there, which seems to be more powerful than eternity, had chained all of reality or chained the universe itself. And the idea of Connor Sims was that it had driven him insane by knowing this, or at least not traditionally insane, but it had driven him to the brink of madness in the sense that his mind couldn't quite grasp it because he had come to the realization there's a being out there of such incredible power. And it's not a being that's kind, it's a being that is dangerous. It's a being that seems to be evil. And so because Connor Sims doesn't see the world the same way people do, the thing that we normally do, because he sees the world in atomic particles and he sees the world in terms of its molecular structure and, and matter and energy and so on and so forth, he basically came to the realization that there's like a giant barrier around the universe that they can't get out of. And so someone has basically turned the Marvel Earth 616 universe into a giant prison. And he's trying to figure out a way to get out, but he's also overwhelmed by this. And so what happens is that while he is, you know, being held in confinement of his own free will due to the fact that he's afraid of his power sort of just breaking 
breaking loose in an unbridled fashion, he's immediately met by the arrival of Thanos. Now, the other half of this is that in the events leading up to Civil War II, uh, Thanos had attacked the planet Earth in pursuit of the Cosmic Cube that had been created by S.H.I.E.L.D., which is what led to Avengers Standoff and the recreation of Steve Rogers' past. Again, we have that in my video on, uh, on Captain America, Steve Rogers. But Thanos had been captured by a combination of the Avengers and the Ultimates and had been held prisoner under the Ultimates' base of operations, which is called the Triskelion. And so because of this, when Connor Sims had arrived and Thanos had come to the realization of just how powerful Connor Sims is, he began to devise a plan to basically manipulate Connor Sims into not only freeing him, but then turning Connor Sims into a puppet for his own goals. And so while Connor Sims is dealing with his own, you know, emotions and the overwhelming nature of what's happening with things, Thanos appears to him and begins manipulating him. Now, this is when Al Ewing starts to incorporate a lot of things in terms of what's going on with Thanos right now, because all we really had with his reemergence was that he was just there, he was looking for a cosmic cube, he was defeated, he had killed James Rhodes, he had injured She-Hulk, and then he was taken prisoner and that was it. We didn't really have anything to go on here. We knew that because of the fact that Mistress Death had barred him from the realm of death, it basically made him effectively immortal, that when the restoration of the multiverse happened by Reed Richards at the end of Secret Wars, that he was just thrown outside of all reality. He was thrown into the realm of nothingness, basically, uh, and that's when he reemerged. But we didn't really know anything else besides that. And so what this did is this turned into a question of what happens next? What happens with Thanos now? And this is what we get. Thanos basically says that over the course of his life, uh, he had fallen in love with Mistress Death. That was, that was his big claim to fame. That was his huge staple before Secret Wars. It was his pursuit of the affections of Mistress Death. It's why he gained the Infinity Gauntlet and wiped out half the life in the universe. It's why he pursued the Cosmic Cube. It's why he did all these things, because he wanted the affections of Mistress Death. The other half of this was that when he was outside of the multiverse, he basically fell in love with a what it seems to be an entity called Nothingness. Now, we know virtually nothing about this. I mean, we don't know if Nothingness is even an entity, or if it's just the idea that Thanos has just fallen to the point where he's just in love with the idea of destroying all things in existence. We have no idea what direction Al Ewing is going with this, but basically Ewing has taken Thanos and removed him from his love with Mistress Death. And so while this is going on, while he's goading Connor Sims, we end up finding that the Ultimates in and of themselves are fighting one another. And the reason why is because with Ulysses predicting that a briefcase, the contents of a briefcase, was going to lead to a massive amount of destruction that Carol Danvers had organized the Ultimates in pursuing a woman named Allison Green. Now this is basically Al Ewing, or at least it seems to be, Al Ewing telling us that Connor Sims is not always right. And the reason why is because while there's some disagreement, while the soldiers of Carol Danvers are a little more harsh than they need to be, and it creates a little bit of rivalry uh, between the Ultimates themselves, when they get the briefcase back and they open it up, they realize there's nothing there. And this just creates a huge amount of backlash in the team. It really leads to like the destruction of the team in traditional means because of the fact that no one agrees. Carol Danvers says, hey, look, like we're trying to stop crimes. Yes, they haven't done anything now, but a guy says he can see the future and he's been accurate so far. So it means that if he says they're going to do something, then they're likely going to. Now, what's interesting about this, and this is one of the reasons why like a lot of fans at the moment hate Carol Danvers, because in the face of a briefcase that's empty, in the face of the fact that Ulysses was wrong, she refuses to accept that. She simply just says, no, 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 he's right. It's, it's just, you know, he was talking about a different briefcase is all it was. He was talking about something else, but he's been right 90% of the time. And so even if he's wrong 10% of the time, it's better to lock up innocent people than to let guilty people go free. And that's basically what she's saying here. That's the case that she's making that yes, innocent people will go to jail, but it's the lesser of two evils. It's worth the risk. And so because of this, while this is happening, Thanos is quite literally showing all this infighting to Connor Sims because Connor Sims is of such a mind right now because of the things that he's done. He's convinced that no one will believe him. And Thanos feeds on that. He says, look, I mean, they're, they're fighting amongst themselves. They can't even agree on how to save the world. What makes you think they're going to agree that you're telling the truth about eternity being confined in chains? You know, and so Connor Sims, again, is a little unsure about his situation, but he says, Thanos says the only way for them to know the truth is for you to show them the truth. And so what happens is he basically escapes from his cell and he allows his power to just explode. Now, not in the sense of, you know, of maximum capacity. If he did that, he would probably destroy the universe, but he allows his power to explode to an extent that it basically overrides the energies of the Triskelion, basically shutting it down. Now, the reason why he does this is because the cell that he's confined in was designed explicitly to keep his powers in check. The issue with this is that no one knew how powerful he was. When Adam Brashear had faced off against Anti-Man, he had an idea of how powerful he was, but he was really fighting Anti-Man on the atomic level, as opposed to fighting him on the level of power that he possessed. And so because of this, we didn't know what it was that he was capable of. And with Adam Brashear not knowing 
showing the full extent of Connor Sims' powers, it came to fruition that Connor Sims just broke out of his cell. And so because of the fact that he broke out of his cell, because of the fact that the uh, confinements of Thanos were no longer powered, he was able to break out of his containment unit and basically start wreaking havoc within the Triskelion. Now, this is one of the best parts of the whole story. <laughs> this is amazing because this is classic Thanos. I mean, when people think of Thanos, this is what they think of. Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet is cool. Thanos with, you know, Cosmic Cube is cool. The best Thanos is Thanos when he's cornered, is when he, when he basically has to fight his way out. That's the best Thanos, not only because of the fact that he's so capable in terms of his abilities, but because of the fact that he is, he's ruthless and he's intelligent. And so again, he basically begins to tell us here, or at least when the Ultimates show up, uh, he goads Connor Sims. Now, a couple things to point out here is that the powers of the Ultimates complement one another. What I mean by this is that at one point in the history of her character, the Carol Danvers went by the name of Binary, whereby she was able to absorb cosmic energies or absorb any kind of energy and then channel those back out as cosmic energies. Now, in truth, this was just Chris Claremont's way of trying to reinvent her character, throw her on the X-Men team and hope it would boost her popularity. It really didn't. Her, her comics were just routinely canceled. And uh, what we're seeing right now with all new all different Marvel is about as successful as she's been since her run in Marvel now when she officially became Captain Marvel. But before that, she really was not a very successful character. People knew who she was, but she couldn't hold a title to save her life. And so what ultimately happens here is Adam Brashear uses his energies to manipulate positive matter, channels them into Carol Danvers, and she basically now has cosmic level powers. The kicker about this is that it doesn't matter with Thanos. Thanos is still able to take her out. Not only that, she's able to use her energies to channel them into Spectrum in order to allow Spectrum, who is basically living energy, to go into the mind of Thanos and try to override his mind. And so it was literally like a chain reaction. Uh, Adam Brashear feeds Carol Danvers, who in turn feeds Spectrum. But when Spectrum enters the mind of Thanos, she realizes that his mental energies are way too much for her to be able to cope with. They're beyond a level she can even begin to comprehend. And that's true with this character. Al Ewing's not retconning anything here. It's always been that way. Thanos' uh, mental energies, his, his mental uh, powers, you know, not necessarily telepathy, different things like that, but just the abilities that he's capable of by using his mind have always been his greatest feat, his intelligence, so on and so forth. When Spectrum goes into his mind, she's literally overwhelmed. And uh, he in turn takes the energy that was being pushed into him by Spectrum and sends that energy back out and shoots it at, at Adam Brashear. And so it's like this giant circle. You know, Adam Brashear charges Carol Danvers, who charges Spectrum, who forces her energies onto Thanos, who in turn takes those energies and shoots Adam Brashear. Now, the reason why this is an important thing when it comes to Thanos is because he always is at the top of his game when it comes to battle. And so because of the fact that he realized that Adam Brashear was the one who was making all of this possible in the first place, taking him out means means that Carol Danvers would not be in her position of binary, and it also means that Spectrum wouldn't be nearly as powerful. Now, the funny thing about all this is that T'Challa's watching all this unfold. Now, in terms of his intelligence, T'Challa is pretty smart, and I would say he's probably smarter than Thanos, just because of the fact that when it comes to the top, you know, five smartest people in the Marvel Universe, Thanos ranks at like number six or number seven. Black Panther is in the top three, as far as I'm aware. And so because of this, Black Panther's just kind of watching things unfold, but even while the Ultimates are doing the best they can to face off against him, Thanos is just trashing him. <laughs> he's trashing them all one by one. And this just shows you how capable he is, that he's going against America Chavez, who can open portals, she can feed off energy. He's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Adam Brashear, who's uh, literally a guy that can manipulate particles. You know, he's going against Carol Danvers, whose strength is on par with the Incredible Hulk in arrested form. I mean, he's going against everybody and doing his own. And so because of the fact that T'Challa is so intelligent, he comes to the realization that they can't fight Thanos with brute force. There's no way they're going to stand a chance. If Thanos can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Incredible Hulk, they can't beat him. And so the only way to defeat him is to use their minds, to use their wits and do the best they can. And so what happens here is they basically shut off access to his mind. They more or less use a mental projection or use, uh, use mental energies, the kind of energies that were designed to keep Connor Sims contained. And they in turn project those mental energies into Thanos and quite literally sever the, I guess, electronic synapses, they basically shut off his brain's ability to function, is essentially what they do. Now, under normal circumstances, and T'Challa tells us this, under normal circumstances, shutting off the brain of Thanos would have killed him. But as we know, he's been barred from the realm of Mistress Death, and so he's basically just in a catatonic state. Now, this is Al Ewing saving Thanos. This is basically him just saying, hey, we're going to use him later on. We're not going to remove this piece from the chessboard yet because he's too good. You know, he's, he's not necessarily the queen, 
queen, but he's certainly a bishop or a rook. And so we're not going to remove him yet because he's a guy that we need to use later on. Now, this will probably feed into some massive crossover event because as most any Marvel fan will tell you, for those of you guys who are new, as most any veteran Marvel comic fan will tell you, if there's any one person in the cosmos to have on your team, when it comes to matters of intelligence, Thanos is one of the guys that you want in your corner. I mean, you know, perfect case scenario, you've got Thanos and Galactus and all the cosmic entities, you know, but if I had to pick one, Thanos would be my guy just because of his experience, because of what he's capable of. And so because of this, you know, the, the Ultimates initially go back to bickering with one another. They go back to arguing with one another, but following Thanos attacking the Ultimates or prior to him attacking the Ultimates, Connor Sims had just taken off. And so we didn't really know where he had went to. We didn't really know what had happened with him. But then what we do is we transition to him as things begin to wrap up and we find that he had just kind of traveled into deep space and he's taking some time to think about everything that's going on, but he's also overwhelmed by the gravity of things because in the mind of Connor Sims, Civil War II is happening. The superheroes are fighting on planet Earth because some inhuman can see the future. But for him, he's like, there's much bigger things to worry about. Like there is a threat out there to the universe, likely even to the multiverse. And so it's like, why are you fighting over this? This is more or less the Civil War II equivalent to Annihilation from Civil War I. And what I mean by that is for those of you guys who don't know, while the Civil War I event was taking place with Captain America and Tony Stark fighting one another, the villain Annihilus had discovered the Negative Zone's equivalent of the power cosmic, the energy that Galactus wields. And Annihilus had invaded the Earth-616 universe and was literally cutting a swath through the universe. I mean, just wiping out planet after planet just wiping out life all over the place. It was really like guerrilla warfare tactics. It was last battle at the Alamo. It was the, the various cosmic forces doing the best they could to just survive. And the heroes on Earth were fighting about superhuman registration. That's basically what's happening with this story right now. Or at least that's what Al Ewing seems to be leading up to. That's one of the reasons why I love the Ultimate so much because it's a huge cosmic event that's going on out here while they're just fighting about Civil War II. It's really setting the landscape for much bigger things. And so as he begins to fall through these dimensional doors, doorways, uh, he begins to, to recall on things. This question is, what happened here? What being exists out there that possesses such incredible power that they're able to completely take over and to chain the universe itself? You know, because in the mind of Connor Sims, with his experience throughout the multiverse, his experience traveling outside of all space and time, the only people capable of doing this are like the Living Tribunal and the One Above All. But apparently not. Apparently somebody else is able to do that. We know it's not the Molecule Man Owen Reese, or at least it doesn't seem to be that way. But as he continues to fall down through things, because his power is on such an extreme degree, if there was anyone that could face off against this multiversal being that's capable of chaining eternity, it would probably be Connor Sims. But Connor Sims going outside and battling this, this entity would probably result in the destruction of the multiverse. Not only that, Galactus was tasked by eternity to make sure no one knew what was going on. Now, why eternity did that, we don't know. And so in response to Connor Sims, falling through, you know, these dimensional barriers and falling outside of all existence, Galactus retrieves him and Galactus transforms him into his new herald. Not only that, what he also says is, go get the ultimates, go find me the ultimates because I'm going to make them heralds as well. And this is basically just Galactus building an army for himself using his power cosmic. It's him creating what looks like it's gonna be six different heralds for the purpose of leading a campaign against whatever this multiversal or this omnipotent being happens to be that managed to chain up eternity. Okay. So I absolutely love Ultimates. Like it's, it's I think really one of the standout titles in all new, all different Marvel and Marvel Now 2.0. The sad thing is that like not a lot of people know about it or they don't know what's going on in it. And so because of that, they're just like missing out on this amazing stuff. So I'm really hoping this video will serve the purpose of letting you guys know what's going on and you guys will go out and buy it because it is an awesome title. So for those of you guys who are curious about like Cosmic Marvel, about like Eternity and Galactus and all that kind of stuff, this takes care of all that. Ultimates covers all that. And we've covered all the ultimate stuff up to this point, but it covers all that. But the big question that people have had is who chained eternity? That was the big question. We saw in all new, all different ultimates that somebody had basically put eternity, the living embodiment of the multiverse in chains. Now, what Al Ewing is doing here is actually offering a little bit of a change with regards to the eternity concept. And we'll get to that once we get further into this video, because 
because what we're basically going to get is the origin of everything that's ever existed in Marvel Comics from the time the very first universe took form up until the collapse of the multiverse now and what not really what happened but in terms of uh, some of the history of the various different uh, multiverses that have existed in between so it, it'll all make sense by the time we get to it uh, it won't be confusing in any way but the idea here is that we initially pick up with Adam Brashear with Blue Marvel basically just kind of like you know staring into and trying to figure out what's going on with everything because remember the Ultimates basically disbanded during the events of Civil War II when Carol Danvers was using the Ultimates as a way to basically carry out her goal of keeping crime from happening before it happened of course Ulysses and all that kind of good stuff but because of the fact that that a lot of people hated Civil War II <laughs> what uh, what Al Ewing ended up doing was basically bringing the Ultimates back together to answer the question of who chained eternity and it was only when the Ultimates had learned this had happened that they began to ask the question of what was going on now from this point we transition over to uh over to Monica Rambeau and the funny thing about Monica Rambeau is Spectrum is that historically she's played a lot of different roles I mean she's been Captain Universe I believe I, I want to say she was Captain Marvel at one point um but the whole idea here I don't think she was Captain Universe I think she was just Captain Marvel um I think it was uh oh I'm, I'm confusing her with the girl from uh Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers the random chick who was in a car wreck and then suddenly saved by the sentience of the universe and became Captain Universe uh we'll, we'll cover that next year but Monica Rambeau's played Captain Marvel for a time and uh and the whole idea is that she was always kind of considered to be a throwaway character by a lot of readers in the sense that she never really received her time in the sun and the cool thing about this is that she actually gets it because what Al Ewing has really been harping on with her character is how powerful she is that she is in effect pure energy that the physical body that we see is not her true form that Adam Brashear looks at her and sees her for what she really is which is basically just pure energy in the form of a human meaning she can basically do anything now we kind of knew that with her character to a degree in the sense that she was able to manipulate all facets of the energy spectrum uh, she could turn into any any form of energy she could use any form of energy that kind of thing but i mean she she can't like warp reality on a universal scale like she can't manipulate molecules or anything like that she's effectively just a giant battery and so it's really really cool to see what kind of limits her powers can be pushed to but again in the midst of all this uh what ends up happening is monica is basically just kind of whisked away and all of it seems to have been done by connor sims now again connor sims as we know him is basically anti-man of course we covered him during the uh the origin story of blue marvel but he had since been turned into a herald of galactus and the reason why was because galactus realizing that eternity had been chained but not knowing who it was that did it basically said if there is a being out there that can chain eternity then i need a new herald and that herald is going to go to the ultimates bring the ultimates to me and make them my heralds and so the idea of, of galactus was to use the ultimates as his heralds essentially functioning as protectors of the universe the way it existed now and that's exactly what happens the various ultimates are basically whisked away by connor sims to uh, galactus's ship tattoo and they're met with uh, america chavez who basically says look there is a massive a massive threat coming and we have to find a way to deal with this now america chavez is one of these characters who's only ever really as interesting as a story that she's in she's not inherently interesting by herself uh, we know this because ultimate uh, like america number one came out sold really well and then america number two tanked so she's just not really an interesting character but for what she does here in the ultimates this makes her interesting and that's why i say in marvel comics a lot of the characters are not inherently intriguing it's the events surrounding them that make them intriguing for example captain universe is not an intriguing character but it's hickman's avengers and new avengers that make uh make uh, captain universe intriguing the same thing with Starbrand and night mask and a lot of those characters it's the events going on around them that make them interesting as opposed to just the characters themselves now of course america chavez being here is basically saying there's something wrong with the multiverse there's some threat out there in the multiverse that's screwing everything up and we are going to have to try to find a way to essentially fix it now of course the other half of this is that uh, galactus and connor sims basically take off and they actually end up meeting directly with the living tribunal and master order and lord chaos now the reason why this happens is because of the fact that we'd seen this before in the previous discussion of the, the previous videos that we've done that the first problem the ultimate solved is basically solving all the problems in the universe the first problem a major problem they solved was galactus they looked at galactus and they said him being the devourer of worlds is a threat to all life in existence what we're going to do is we're basically going to evolve him into his perfect form and make him the life bringer now the reason why galactus being made the life bringer was such a huge deal in terms of the, the contents of this story is that from the perspective of master order and lord chaos they represent opposing sides right i mean we've had this this discussion countless times and we'll have this discussion again when we basically remaster infinity gauntlet and when we do infinity war and all that cosmic stuff next year the whole idea is that the universe is basically in balance there is order and there's chaos and you can't have one without the other a perfectly ordered universe would look crazy a perfectly chaotic universe would look 
look just as crazy. Jim Starlin showed us those two things when we basically went inside the minds of Thanos and Adam Warlock to see a perfect universe in Adam Warlock's mind and a chaotic universe in Thanos' mind. So because of this, they basically work in unison. The issue here is that in the mind, in the perspective of Master Order and Lord Chaos, Galactus is supposed to be the devourer of worlds. That's his role in the universe. That's the role that he plays. In the same way that Master Order, uh, Order and Lord Chaos play the role of two opposites with the in-betweener being the reconciliation between Order and Chaos, in the same way that Eternity plays the role of being the living embodiment of the universe and so on, Galactus is supposed to play the role of the world devourer. Now, because of the fact that he's not doing this, they end up invoking the Living Tribunal because remember, the Living Tribunal is basically the judge. Whenever there's a cosmic disagreement, the Living Tribunal is invoked and the Tribunal will determine whether or not the actions of a being is or are basically in violation of cosmic order, which is to say, if there were a being that were nigh unstoppable that no one could oppose, then the Living Tribunal would say, this person is not part of the cosmic order. They're an aberration. They're a screw up. That was the whole thing with the character of Protege, who basically copied the powers of everybody that he saw, and it made him vir virtually godlike to the point that even Protege was able to go again, go toe to toe with the Living Tribunal. And so the idea here is to basically have Galactus on trial and say, Galactus is supposed to be the devourer of worlds. If he's not doing this, he's not part of the cosmic order. He's not maintaining his role. He's going against cosmic law. Ultimately, the Living Tribunal says, no, if this is going to be the case with Galactus, then this is basically his perfect iteration. This is his perfect form. He has moved in the direction, moved into his next stage of evolution. He's not violating any laws. Now, the issue that's made with this is that the Living Tribunal also establishes that because of the fact that the all new, all different Marvel universe and even multiverse is still new, that the cosmic law is still being made. The hierarchy is still being constructed. So for those of you guys who were asking for a new hierarchy for all new, all different Marvel, a new cosmic and power hierarchy, we can't do that yet because we don't know what the hierarchy is. And this plays out when Master Order and Lord Chaos kill the Living Tribunal. Now again, because of the fact that they kill the Tribunal and essentially take his place, what they do in turn is they move on and say, we are going to impose our will, we're going to impose our order onto everything. We're going to make the universe bend to our will. It's going to be how we believe it should be. It's going to function the way that we think it should. Now, in the midst of all this, we end up coming across some sort of crazy enigmatic kind of energy that makes its presence known to the Ultimates. Now, of course, as this energy is fought by the Ultimates, as this energy begins to coalesce, we end up finding out that this energy is the Shaper of Worlds. Now, this is really kind of cool because the Shaper of Worlds is basically a cosmic cube that went crazy. Now, the funny thing about this is that the Shaper of Worlds cannot really do anything on its own. Because it's a cosmic cube, a cosmic cube is basically bound to the intention of the person who wields it. And so it would be like if I gave you a pencil, all right? The pencil can only do what you do with it. The pencil can't draw by itself. The pencil needs you to pick it up and draw something on a piece of paper. And that's how a cosmic cube works. The cosmic cube can't do anything on its own. The Shaper of Worlds is the exact same way. Now, what the Shaper basically tells us is that when it came into existence in the Marvel Universe before Secret Wars, that it basically functioned in all the ways that we saw it do its whole thing, that it would be a villain, it would show up, it would do some crazy things here and there. But when the collapse of the multiverse took place, the Shaper of Worlds was effectively ushered outside all space and time. And when it did, it saw something out there. It saw a force out there that nobody knew about. And so because of that, it basically confined this, confined him down to, the, to a singular point where it more or less drove him insane, but it also made his energy signature, you know, incorporeal. And so what it's been doing is basically reconstituting itself down to a recognizable form, which is, in, uh, you know, then in turn harnessed by Adam Brashear and the Ultimates more or less for safekeeping. And so because of the fact that the Living Tribunal has essentially been killed, the first step of Master Order and Lord Chaos is bonding themselves into the being Logos, and then to also try to basically force Galactus back into being the devourer of worlds. In terms of them individually, they're not able to force Galactus back into the position of being the devourer of worlds. And so for the most part, they launch an attack, but nothing really happens. Galactus just fixes himself and then he calls it a day. But what Al Ewing also does here is he invokes a guy by the name of Jim Tenson. Now, Jim Tenson is a new creation. He's something newly introduced by Al Ewing. And so is a lot of the stuff that we're going to see with a group called the Troubleshooters. And these are basically uh, kind of recruits that have been organized under Jim Tenson for the purpose of operating as like a black ops team or like a recon team and intelligence team. Now, initially, Jim Tenson is contacted by Phil Vaught. Of course, we know him as the governmental li uh, liaison who's been tasked with monitoring the Ultimates. Of course, the reason why the government did that is because of the amount of power the Ultimates possess and the idea 
idea that they were basically running around in space without anybody keeping an eye on them. And so what this does is this basically reveals to us that both Phil Vaught and Jim Tenson were part of a group called the First Eternity Battalion. Now, we're not going to learn a whole lot about them, but we're going to learn a little bit more here in a little uh, here in a little while, just enough to kind of give us some context. And that's really about it. And it makes sense just because these are characters that are being introduced. It would really be way too much information if we got origin stories for all these guys over the course of a six issue story. It would just it'd be way too long, it'd be way too convoluted, way too confusing, and it would throw everybody off. And so we're basically just kind of given this little bit of information about Jim Tenson. But the idea here is that from Phil Vaught's perspective, Jim Tenson, as well as this guy Simon Rodsvo, which we'll, we'll learn about him here in a minute, um, the idea is that because the Ultimates are more or less running around with any without anybody keeping an eye on them, and because of the fact that they basically disbanded and then reformed against the wishes of the federal government, the troubleshooters are being sent in to monitor uh, the Ultimates secretly to investigate their base of operations to make sure they're not up to anything nefarious, and to also essentially bring them in and say, you guys are not supposed to be banded together, you guys have to answer to the government in terms of why you're doing this. Now, jumping back to Master Order and Lord Chaos, again, because of the fact that they failed in their attempts to, uh, to, to force Galactus back into his normal state, we end up having Connor Sims whisked away by Galactus as soon as the Living Tribunal died. Basically, Galactus said, okay, things are popping off, things are going crazy, get out of here, go, get the ultimates, tell them what's going on. That was one of the coolest moments, was when he basically just kind of whisked him away, because that's when you know that things were getting incredibly serious. And that's the coolest thing, is because Galactus is such an imposing character in Marvel Comics, such a powerful character in Marvel Comics, that when he's with his Herald and things begin to sort of panic, you can almost kind of see him looking at the situation a little fearful and just kind of whispering to Connor Sims, look man, go tell the Ultimates what's going on before things are too late. And like whisking the Ultimate, you know, whisking him away to go find the Ultimate. So it's really cool because it's a great way to show us the gravity of the situation. Now, because because Master Order and Lord Chaos were unable to force their uh, their power onto uh, onto Galactus, they travel to the Inbetweener. Remember, the Inbetweener was created by Master Order and Lord Chaos for the purpose of basically having a balance, a physical representation of the balance between Order and Chaos. But by absorbing the Inbetweener into them, and then with uh, with Master Order absorbing uh, you know Lord Chaos into himself, what basically ends up happening here is we end up having a newly for a newly created being formed called Logos. And this is really kind of a cool idea because now what it gives us is a new cosmic entity. And it's actually pretty interesting because the first thing this cosmic entity does is it, is it looks around and it says all these celestials and so on and so forth, they're all aberrations. They're all things that do not need to exist. They're held, they're holdovers from the way things used to be. A new order must be maintained. A new universe has been created and the cosmic landscape must reflect this new universe. And so what happens is Logos obliterates every last one of the celestials, save for one. And the one celestial that is saved is essentially the one above all of the of the celestials. Now, this brings into sharp relief the question of the one above all. How does it function? This is a super simple answer. There's two versions of the one above all. There is the god of the Marvel multiverse, the one that we tried to kill and failed, and then there's the one above all celestial. They're two distinctly different beings. Don't worry, People get them confused all the time. So <laughs> it's cool. Don't don't sweat it if you're kind of a little thrown off by it. You're not the only one. A lot of folks kind of get thrown off by that, but we'll just call him the top celestial just for the sake of keeping things easy. Even then, this is really the only time we see him, but top celestial is basically saved by the Never Queen. Now, the Never Queen was actually a Dan Slot creation as far as I'm aware, and she originally appeared in Silver Surfer. But the Never Queen was really more of like a plot device that Dan Slot made, but because she was established to be a cosmic entity, she's basically been rolled over into all the other stories that involve cosmic entities. But the Never Queen basically exists outside of all things that currently exist, and she represents things that could possibly exist. So again, we're really getting, getting into the realm of hypotheticals, so on and so forth. But because of the fact that everything happening in the universe is taking place in the present, she's always one step ahead. She's always in the future. She always represents the possibility of what could be. So the Never Queen is composed of the possibility of you going left instead of going right. The Never Queen is, is composed of the possibility of you waking up instead of of dying. She's just composed of all the possibilities that could exist. That's what makes up who she is. So again, it's kind of crazy, but it, but she fits perfectly into the realm of abstract characters. Now, the problem with this is that in the midst of the troubleshooters residing inside the base of operations for the Ultimates, their presence culminates in the Ultimates arriving to see them there. And so what ends up happening is the Ultimates face off against the troubleshooters, and it's kind of a cool conflict to see. It's not wildly significant, but it's cool to see their various counterbalances. But what ends up happening here is Jim Tenson keeps tapping into something called the Psyforce. Now, we don't know a whole lot about what the Psyforce is,
is. We simply just know that it's there. But the big guy who's really important to focus on here is Rotsvo. This guy initially goes against uh, Blue Marvel, Adam Brashear, and then easily overpowers him. And the biggest question to ask here is that if Adam Brashear is one of the most powerful beings in existence in Marvel Comics, then how much more powerful could Rosvo really be if he's going to overpower Adam Brashear in his entirety? So again, what seems to be the indication is that this Rosvo guy is a guy who's not supposed to be here, that he's someone who's a bit of an aberration. He's a guy that's not what he appears to be. And so again, in the middle of this battle between the Ultimates and the Troubleshooters, Logos returns to Galactus and forces him back into being the Devourer of Worlds. And when I first read this, I was just like, wow, like it blew my mind because Logos is basically like, you're going to go back to being who you were, whether you want to be or not. And so it's kind of this impurity that spilled all over Galactus. And one of the final words he says is, I hunger. Now, the depiction of Galactus as he appears here in terms of how he's drawn is designed to be that way. He looks screwed up. He looks wrong. He looks corrupted. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. That's how he's supposed to appear, simply because of the fact that this is not his normal state. He's being forced back into an artificial state because remember, he basically evolved into his next stage, which was the life bringer, basically the ability to create life as opposed to destroying it. But what also ends up happening here is that Rosvo emerges in the midst of this fight with the Ultimates and basically becomes this sheer wrecking force, absolutely decimating every single member of the Ultimates. Now, of course, Galactus basically teleports back to where everybody's located at, but almost immediately falls. And so what we end up finding out is that with regards to Rotsvo being here, with regards to, you know, all these different things that are going on with Logos, with Master Order, Lord Chaos, all of this has basically been implemented itself by something called the First firmament. And this is when we start to get into the timeline of things making sense. Now, it kind of boggled me a little bit because up until this point in the story, things seem very disjointed all over the place. And it was a good read, but I would rather have had this timeline, you know, at the beginning of the story. That being said, having it at the end actually makes it a little more impactful just because of the fact that it gives us all the answers that we've been looking for all this time. And so what happens is Al Ewing goes all the way back to the very beginning of all things. Now, in Marvel Comics, we knew this was the case, right? Like, you know, before Secret War, you had Marvel, the multiverse, all that kind of stuff. The universe that you think of when you think of Marvel. So when Spider-Man first appeared, when the Incredible Hulk first appeared, Iron Man, all that kind of good stuff. Of course, we had the universe that Galactus hailed from, the multiverse, or I guess really the universe before the current version of the multiverse. And then we had, you know, all these different universes and so on and so forth, dating back to the point when the very first universe came into existence somewhere along the line in Marvel Comics. What we end up finding out here is that this being the first firmament basically created life as the singular representation of the very, very first universe, the Firmament made a group called the Aspirants. What Al Ewing is drawing on here is he's actually drawing on Kieran Gillen, I think it is, his run of Iron Man, which was absolutely amazing. But one of the things that Kieran Gillen established was that at some point in the history of the universe, that there were a massive number of Celestials, but there was a war that had broken out between the Celestials and the Aspirants. Now, we didn't know what the Aspirants looked like. We didn't know their history. All we knew is that they were just some group with power equal to that of the Celestials, and it resulted in the aspirants basically overtaking the Celestials, pushing them to the brink of almost complete and total extinction. In an act of desperation, the Celestials created something called the God Killer Armor, and the God Killer Armor basically obliterated the, the uh, aspirants and pushed them to the brink of all destruction. Now, that is the most recent version of the Marvel Universe, so we'll call that uh, the seventh Marvel Multiverse. In this first Marvel Multiverse, what we're seeing here right now, this is basically just a war that broke out between the aspirants and the Celestials, which is always destined to do. But in this war that initially broke out, it led to the destruction of that universe. And when the universe was reborn as the second universe, the uh, the first firmament basically spread out. And so what we basically get up to this point is that there was a singular universe with the destruction of the, of the first universe, it exploded into a multiverse. And so with the creation of this multiverse came the cosmic entities that we know them, eternity and so on and so forth. And so because of that, in this basically this second multiverse, things progressed. The wars repeated yet again, the war between the aspirants, the war between the Celestials. It kept happening over and over and over again throughout every single multiverse that was created up to the seventh multiverse, which went into Secret Wars, which went into the eighth multiverse as we have it right now. But despite all these different conflicts that had happened, the first firmament was always in the back. This energy force was just always in the back watching everything unfold. And the first firmament was plotting its revenge, was plotting its way to basically eliminate all things in existence, retake the universe back unto itself, and then be the 
solar universe in existence, basically consolidating everything back down. And so because of this, the first firmament began to launch a series of campaigns aimed at basically destabilizing all things in existence and trying to create aberrations that would make eternity extremely weak due to the fact that following the new formation of the universe or the multiverse, eternity was already in a weakened state. So it would allow the, uh, allow the first firmament to basically overpower eternity, put it in chains, and then begin the process of destroying everything. Now, the reason why I say that Al Ewing is basically going through and offering changes is because historically speaking in Marvel Comics, eternity was the physical representation of a universe. And so there were an infinite number of eternities, one for each universe. The idea had been toyed with that there was a singular eternity that made up the multiverse, but there was nothing to indicate that it was actually true. What Al Ewing is doing here is making it true. Al Ewing is saying now, there's a multiversal eternity. There's one eternity that represents or is the physical embodiment of the multiverse. Inside that multiversal eternity are all the infinite number of universes and one eternity for each of those universes. So again, it's a little interesting, you know, at the very least, but again, it basically expands the Marvel cosmology. Now, of course, switching back to the conflict as it exists right now, of course, what we end up doing is we end up having Connor Sims basically resurrected by the combined efforts of Monica Rambeau and Adam Brashear. And so because of the fact that Connor Sims is brought back, uh, Connor Sims basically containing what's left of the life bringer energy essentially takes himself directly to Galactus and merges himself with Galactus to a degree in the sense that he disperses himself into Galactus. As a result, Galactus is reborn as the life bringer and then destroys Rotsvo and in doing so learns everything that Rotsvo knows, which is basically the first firmament. The idea that this first firmament has struck first, that this entire event, everything we've seen up to this point is the first battle. It's the opening salvo. It's the first skirmish and the first firmament intends to launch a massive campaign against the entire multiverse, destroying essentially everything and bringing all things into existence back into itself and then being a singular universe unto itself going forward. Okay, so getting into this newest story of the Ultimates, a lot of people have been asking me to cover this. The biggest problem is that Marvel releases their stories monthly, so we've had to wait like four or five or six months for this story to finish before we could cover it. That's what's so irritating about the way Marvel publishes right now, because DC has spoiled me so bad. DC releases bi-weekly for like their most popular titles, and so by the time a story comes to an end, I actually have to go back and read it again, because I usually forget what happened at the very beginning. But what this story is, is basically something called Eternal. Eternity War, and this focuses on the idea of what is quite literally a battle of cosmic entities. Now, what this also does is it requires us to understand like the new Marvel cosmic hierarchy and the way the multiverse works. Fortunately, you'll find a link down in the description to that video that I made quite some time ago, and it basically runs over the new multiverse and all that kind of good stuff. Now, to brush back up on that, for those of you guys who just don't have the time or the inclination to watch it, the long and short of it is that Marvel, with the Ultimates line of stories, introduced something called the First Firmament. And what they told us is that in the very beginning of all things, there was just this singular universe, and this universe was sentient. Every universe has been sentient. So if the universe could get up and walk around, it would be the first firmament. Now, the first firmament created life in the form of beings called the Celestials. And most people know who the Celestials are by this point. They're just these super powerful beings that are basically responsible for creating life and different things like that. But the Celestials that were created by the firmament existed in two forms, those who were faithful to the firmament and those who were not. Those those who were faithful were called the aspirants. Those who were not were just called celestials. Now what this did is it basically led to this massive war, like this, this giant civil war among these beings that had enough power to basically control and manipulate all of reality itself. And so like you would expect, this war quite literally laid waste to the universe. And what ended up happening is like you picking up a glass cup and dropping it on the ground, the universe completely shattered. Now of course what this did is all these different shattered pieces became universes of their own and that was the explanation of how the multiverse came into existence. Now, for reasons that are never explained, that multiverse was destroyed and then recreated and destroyed and recreated and destroyed and recreated, so on and so forth, leading all the way up to Jonathan Hickman's collapse of the multiverse and Avengers and New Avengers, and then the start of all new, all different Marvel. But what Ultimates does in the all new, uh, all new, all different Marvel line of comics is it gives us the first firmament as this being that's basically existed outside of all time and space and is finally making its return. But the reason why this matters is because we're talking about a level of power so extreme that the first firmament was actually able to quote unquote 
chain up the multiverse. Now, this is when we start getting into like ab abstract things. For the most part, when it comes to comics, things are really easy to understand when people are able to just kind of crack open a comic and read what's going on. Mostly because of the fact that when the average person goes and reads a comic book, it's easy to digest. The Incredible Hulk is pissed off. The Incredible Hulk is going to smash stuff. That's super simple. But when it comes to like cosmic entities, we're dealing with abstracts. We're dealing with a level of power so extreme that it can literally result in the destruction of all things in existence. And that's what I want you to keep in the back of your head. What we're going to be seeing over the course of this story is a level of power among these beings that's so insane that if one of them were to lose it, it would destroy all things in existence. Well, except for the Ultimates. We'll talk about them here in a second. But that's basically what this is. It's a fight for all existence. The way this opens up is with Galactus the Lifebringer. Now remember, if you're catching up on this, if you haven't seen any of the Ultimates videos that we've done so far, Galactus has always been the world devourer. That was always his thing. He would travel across the cosmos. He would consume worlds that were able to sustain life. He would keep his energies in check. And that was really it. With all new, all different Marvel, the first thing the team of the Ultimates did was band together and then basically transform Galactus into the life bringer so that he would no longer be a threat to the universe. Instead, he would be a force for good instead of a force for destruction. Now, of course, this sent Galactus on the path of going through and just like recreating worlds that he'd previously consumed, any number of things that like a superhero with that insane level of power would possibly do. The problem with this is that once Galactus learned that the first firmament had basically returned and this being was of such an extreme level of power that it was able to basically chain up the multiverse galactus panic now if that does not give you an indication of how powerful the first firmament is i don't know what will because keep in mind with the power of galactus he can create life he can end life he can manipulate the universe itself i mean he's just a being really one of the most powerful beings in existence out there but the idea is that galactus had basically been trying to fight off as best he can and literally running for his life in almost every conceivable situation because he'd been confronted by these beings that were working for the first firmament that were equal or superior to his own power. And so what he ended up doing was actually taking up refuge in a place that was basically created by the Molecule Man Owen Reese. Now remember, the Molecule Man basically sat alongside classic Reed Richards, Franklin Richards, and those guys, and they were the ones creating the new universes in all new, all different Marvel. The idea was that because the Molecule Man was so insane in terms of his abilities, he also created kind of like this pocket universe for himself. And it was a place for him to just kind of hang out and kind of reside. Now, of course, what we're told by Galactus is that Molecule Man had long since abandoned this place. We don't know where he went to. We have no idea whatever happened to him. He had basically just taken off. And so because of this, Galactus basically co-opted this pocket dimension for himself. And then actually, once he emerges, he's on the planet of Ego. Now, Ego is kind of a weird situation because in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is how most people are being introduced to his character, he is pretty different than he is in Marvel Comics. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Marvel calls him a celestial. He's actually not. He's literally just a guy uh, who had tried to save his planet from a sun that was going supernova. He ultimately failed and he actually merged with all the people on his planet and the planet itself. And that's why he's called Ego the Living Planet. Now, the funny thing about this is that Ego hates Galactus. And the reason for this, as crazy as it sounds, is because when Galactus and Ego first fought, Galactus actually attached a rocket to his back end and sent him hurtling through space. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. That's when you learn the whole origin story of Ego. The problem with this is that as powerful as Ego is, he's only ever really powerful on his own, uh, on his home planet. It would be like if you had the ability to control whatever it was that your home did. If your home could get up and walk around, you could control whatever it was that you wanted it to do. Ego's like that with his home planet. So Ego, for example, cannot control Earth. With Galactus arriving here, because of the fact that he's exhausted with his own energies, he's not necessarily able to overpower Ego. Instead, it actually turns into really more of a diplomatic mission. And the reason for this is because Galactus is traveling around the cosmos and assembling a team of some of the most powerful beings in existence. The goal of Galactus is to recruit Ego to his side as just one of many people who can pull this off. Now, is Galactus perfectly aware of the fact that none of these guys could actually destroy the First Firmament or defeat them? It's just a matter of, is it possible for them to? So, of course, this leads to, to Galactus actually modifying, using his powers to modify Ego the Living Planet, transform him into Ego Prime. So he's actually a full bodied entity, which is cool because we've never seen this before. Not only that, once Ego is taken by Galactus and brought to basically
basically the uh, the Eternity Watch is what they call themselves, we end up having a lot of these beings who are basically some of the most powerful beings in existence. Now, keep in mind, the cosmic entities as we think of them, the Celestials, Infinity, these characters, they were all destroyed in the last couple arcs that we covered. So Galactus normally would have reached out to them, but they've all been destroyed. And so because of that, it's literally him grabbing whoever's left. Now, some of these characters are extremely ambiguous, like Infinite, for example. We don't know anything about him, but then there's people like the Shaper of Worlds and there's the Cyhawk. Now, Cyhawk is kind of a weird situation because Cyhawk was actually created by a guy named Archie Goodwin back in 1986 in a series called Cyforce that ran for about three years. Now, the idea is that he actually hails from a comic line called New Universe, which was relatively popular at the time, but never really regained steam. Eventually, Warren Ellis tried to relaunch it with New Universal, but it's basically as close as we get to the real world if people develop powers. The idea is that the Cyhawk, uh, the best example I can use here, and this is going to be a shameless example, the best example I can use here is like Captain Planet is <laughs> is really it. You know, when the Planeteers combine their powers, they get Captain Planet. When the members of the Psy Force combine their powers, they get Psyhawk. That's it. That's really all there is. It's just a being of insane psychic power. But again, you know, it's it's one of those weird, ambiguous scenarios just kind of thrown in here and rolled in just because of the fact that Galactus is reaching for whatever he can get. And so that's what these guys are. They're basically the leftovers. <laughs> that's really the best way to call them. They're just kind of, you know, whatever it is that they can do to try to stay off this conflict, but it's kind of crazy because this takes the annihilation slash civil war concept and expands it to a broader scale. For those of you guys who don't know, back when Marvel launched the original Civil War event, you know, Captain America versus Iron Man, that was an Earth-based conflict, and that was it. It was strictly confined to Earth. But while that conflict was going on, this villain, Annihilus, from the Negative Zone, had invaded the universe. And it was the craziest thing because, like, Richard Ryder, who was playing the role of Nova at the time, showed up on Earth and is like, what are you guys doing? Like, the universe is about to be overrun and destroyed what in the world is going on like it was it was one of the funniest things to happen there it was really kind of a cool moment but the idea here is that it's, it's on a much broader scale so while secret empire is happening and hydra captain america is like i'm gonna make the world a better place like all existence is on the brink of complete and total collapse and so what we end up doing here is we actually transition and we end up finding out that galactus is not the only person involved here there is another being who is involved in trying to figure out a way to keep this collapse of the multiverse from happening and that this being is actually reed richards also known as the maker alongside the high evolutionary now we'll get into uh the high evolutionary herbert windham here in a second but i want to talk about the maker because the maker is really one of the cooler characters that exists in marvel comics but he's also a character that marvel's never really done uh, a whole lot with outside of the ultimate universe in terms of him crossing over and that makes sense because there was never a reason for him to but the idea is that the maker this version of reed richards from the ultimate universe his origin story is is basically what you saw in that terrible Fox film that has a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes, which it rightfully deserves, except for Michael B. Jordan. He was amazing. But the idea is that this version of Reed was very similar to his main Marvel counterpart in the sense that he was a genius. He became part of a think tank. Eventually, he branched off, formed the Fantastic Four, so on and so forth. The difference here is that in 2009, Marvel launched an event in the Ultimate Universe called Ultimatum. And this event was basically all of the superheroes in the Ultimate Universe versus Magneto. And it was amazing. I liked Ultimatum. A lot of people hated it. A lot of people did not like Ultimatum at all. <laughs> but I enjoyed Ultimatum. It was kind of a cool thing. But this was one of those stories that was designed to implement a paradigm shift. And one of the things that it saw was basically Reed Richards in the Ultimate Universe falling from grace, so to speak, his marriage proposal being rejected by Susan Storm, so on and so forth, and then eventually becoming a bad guy. And so what this did is that he really rechristened himself as the maker. Now, it also led into things like Children of Tomorrow, which is kind of cool. And honestly, I wouldn't mind covering that. I mean, I always thought aspects of the Ultimate Universe were always kind of fun and kind of interesting. The problem is that most people on my channel don't really seem to care. <laughs> but it's kind of a cool scenario because he was actually one half of the equation when it came to Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. There came a point when Ultimate Reed actually joined the Cabal of Thanos in trying to destroy different Earths across the multiverse. But the idea here is that uh, the Maker's actually working alongside Herbert Wyndham. Now, the High Evolutionary is actually a guy who basically evolved his own molecular structure. He was obsessed with the idea of human evolution. Now, of course, modifying his own self, he gave himself basically godlike powers. He is a human being pushed to the extreme of what humans will most likely become. But he also just kind of became this mad scientist in the sense that he just kind of hung out in Wondegore Mountain and he basically just created like all these different things. He had like counter earth, so on and so forth. And that's actually where these guys are right now. They are in counter earth. They're basically, it's basically another earth that's orbiting, but that's kind of the weird thing. And that's the disconnect.
effect because you'll never see counter earth in any other stories in marvel comics you will only see it in this which is one of the big reasons why people are just kind of like okay continuity is out the window in marvel because you would think that if there was another earth orbiting around the existing earth then somebody out there would have noticed <laughs> but it's kind of a weird scenario because what they've basically come to the conclusion of is that with eternity quote unquote basically being chained by the first firmament their goal is to essentially grab all these different universes and merge them into one now the belief is that it will basically empower eternity it'll make eternity more powerful than it was before remember eternity is a living embodiment of the universe and so the idea is to merge all of these universes into one and then feed that energy directly into eternity giving it the power to escape the first firmament the problem with this is that we don't know if it'll really succeed and of course it does to a degree but the issue is that it actually coincides with the maker and high evolutionary watching all these events unfold with regards to galactus and his his eternity watch facing off against these astronauts these faithful celestials to the first firmament itself and of course where they do the best they can to face off against these forces in the end it's really not much of a battle because we're talking about a conflict that is extreme in the degree and so what we end up doing is we actually transition to black panther and to a place called the necropolis now the crazy thing about what black panther is doing is he's actually being pretty dangerous when it comes to the various gods in marvel comics especially the panther god the being that basically provides black panther with his various abilities the panther god is pretty pretty selfish. Like the Panther God's like, look, you will worship me and no one else. Now, with regards to what Black Panther is doing, the Necropolis was actually a concept that I believe was created by Jonathan Hickman. And it was a way for uh, Black Panther to actually talk to anyone who's ever been a Black Panther in the history of Wakanda. Basically him going to those who have greater experience and who were wiser than him, but have long since passed away and say, what do you guys think that I should do here? Now that fit in nicely with the Black Panther concept because it allowed T'Challa to basically maintain the autonomy of Wakanda while also seeking outside counsel and so reaching out to those who have basically seen where these things will reside or at the very least who have a general idea of what the best road is to take allows him to basically say look I don't know everything that this that's out there I don't know everything that exists I need your help in figuring these things out again we'll talk more about that once we get into Avengers and new Avengers but the idea is that because he cannot necessarily go to the Panther God because they're kind of on strenuous terms which of course is in his own comic the idea is that instead he reaches out to the Tiger God and this is kind of cool because it gives us all these different pantheons, these different animal beings that exist out there. But the tiger god basically emerged when the first beings came into existence. And while the tiger god does represent the idea that humans were terrified of tigers, you know, back in the early days, it's also the idea that the tiger god basically represents the very essence of what it means for humans to feel fear. It is the, the full culmination of humanity's fear combined into a singular being. But the idea is that Black Panther really kind of fights against the tiger god for a second, only to basically try to usurp its power now of course this leads directly to the maker and the high evolutionary being successful in their goal to channel all these uh universes energies into eternity and then ultimately free it but it has a side effect of bringing in the original ultimates and that's where people begin to look at these things now something else that i want you to notice here is that among these original ultimates is the ultimate incredible hulk and that's why i say during the events of secret empire that was not ultimate hulk that was just regular bruce banner we know that because he's in this story right now now it also begs the question you know is marvel just kind of blowing you know throwing continuity out the window which they seem to be doing and it's entirely possible but the fact remains here that because of the fact that these different universes are all basically coalescing into one another it allows you know galactus and his eternity watch to actually jump out of all space and time so they're literally in this white space they're outside of all things in existence they can actually watch things in existence take place now keep in mind we're talking about beings who are of the highest order so it's not like you standing in las vegas and trying to see what's happening in los angeles they have this sort of multiversal cosmic awareness and so they can stand outside of the multiverse itself they can stand outside of all things and still see what's going on inside the idea here is that again galactus begins to hit home at the concept that if the first firmament is not stopped or this first universe isn't isn't halted then it'll result in the destruction of all things in existence which includes all the remaining cosmic entities death so on and so forth the cool thing about this is that it also basically has the ultimates the the newest version of the ultimates facing off against their previous their alternate reality counterparts now the funny thing about this is that people look at blue marvel adam brashear and in a lot of ways he's kind of a write-off now of course people have recently on youtube been talking about him more and more but basically blue marvel is one of marvel's versions of superman that's really it now he's also a genius in a lot of different ways but his power is not to be trifled with and in this instance he knocks out ultimate hulk 
in one punch. That's all it takes. He literally just uppercuts him in the chin and that's the end of Ultimate Hulk. I mean, he's just down. Now, the idea here is that because he's so empowered and because he takes out the, you know, Ultimate Hulk so fast, it immediately catches the attention of the other Ultimates, the, uh, the original Ultimates. Now, of course, they continue fighting on until America Chavez basically says, hey, look, we're the current Ultimates here in this universe. Now, it's basically the Avengers from one universe meeting the Avengers from another universe. And at that point, it just creates a ceasefire. It is this classic Ultimates Captain America basically saying, everybody stop everybody stand down. If they are effectively Avengers and we're basically Avengers, then we need to talk this out and figure out what's going on. The problem with this is that by combining their efforts together, they come to the realization that what the maker did was by freeing eternity, it basically allowed eternity to be consumed by the first firmament to literally allow the first firmament to bolster its own power. And so inadvertently, he actually achieved the opposite of what he was shooting for. Now, none of this matters anyway, just because of the fact that the maker, as we see him here, is just as arrogant as he ever was when he was in the ultimate universe. And so because of this, it literally leads to him just being destroyed by uh, by Spectrum, this living source of energy. That's all she is. She's energy in physical form. And that's really all there is to it. He gets wiped out pretty fast. Now, I would argue the reason why this is done is because of the fact that the maker is also still going on in infamous Iron Man. So again, this is the whole continuity thing. This is why things are getting kind of weird. For those of you guys that never read DCU, this is the problem people had when it came to DC Comics. Characters appear in one story, they don't appear in the other. There's no no continuity. We don't know when, what story, when these stories take place. If one follows the other, it gets really weird and it gets really bonkers and it gets really bananas. But the idea here is because of the fact that eternity has been consumed by the first firmament, the goal of the ultimates as they exist is to combine a combination of their powers as well as their brains to task and actually jumpstart uh, eternity again. And what this does is it brings him back. Not only that, because he's effectively resurrected here, it also brings about the reintroduction of all these different different cosmic entities. Because remember, they are all effectively children of eternity. That's the way it worked when it came to Marvel Comics. You have eternity, the embodiment of the universe, and then like, you know, a man and a woman giving birth to a kid, eternity just started popping out all these cosmic entities, different things like that. Those uh, celestials who were destroyed by the first firmament are basically resurrected here. They're essentially brought back. And so again, it's kind of eternity giving birth to all these things, bringing all these entities back again. And so because of that, we also end up finding out that the Queen of Nevers had actually taken the last of the Celestials before they were destroyed. And so this one Celestial that did survive gave birth to even more Celestials. And so again, it's basically this return to familiarity. It's everything resetting itself back to the way it was before, just by virtue of eternity popping up. So again, it's really just this idea that this being that literally exists as the culmination of the universe is returning the universe back to the way that it's supposed to be. Now, of course, things wrap up pretty fast here. And it's actually kind of disappointing the way it wraps up so fast. The reason for this is because of the fact that if you're not familiar with what Marvel's doing right now, Marvel's basically doing legacy and generations. And the idea is there was so much negative backlash to Secret Empire. There was so much negative backlash to Marvel basically switching characters over, getting rid of classic characters, replacing them with new ones, that Marvel hit the panic button. And instead, they said, okay, fine, we need to basically bring back everything the way that it used to be. And so this story, believe it or not, this is actually Ultimates 2, issue number 100. This is legacy numbering. What Marvel originally wanted was Ultimates 2 issues 7 through 12. That's what the story was slated for. But because of the whole renumbering thing, it's been shortened by two issues. And then in turn, they've just tacked on, you know, this ending sort of ramrodded it into the conclusion of the story. So it was supposed to drag on longer as far as I can tell, but it's not. And so things basically just end. The first firmament is just defeated right off the bat. That's really it. And then that just kind of brings an end to the story. Things just kind of get reset to normal. And that's that. It's this quick you know, super into a story that should have otherwise been drawn out by a couple more issues and actually probably would have had more of a successful closure to it. But the fact remains with this particular thing, it's it's really just things going back to normal to a degree. Galactus still remains a life bringer. But again, because of the fact that this takes place before the conclusion of Secret Empire, what it does is it just shows the rest of the, the members of the Ultimates going through and doing their own thing. Carol Danvers taking out Hydra, Black Panther going back to uh, going back to Wakanda with the Tiger God in his possession, presumably meaning that he's going to start drawing his power from a new entity. But again, it's, it's one of these weird scenarios because the story just kind of ends. It just kind of comes to a conclusion. But with that being said, guys, uh, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace. All right, so as promised, our shout outs for the producers of the Comics Explained videos, our patrons. 
I want to give a shout out to Jason C, Austin S, Jason S, Austin H, Philip, and Austin B. We have a lot of Austins in our Patreon, <laughs> as well as Genosis916. Genosis didn't give us a first and last name, so we kind of had to roll with it. I didn't mention your all's last names. I figured you guys didn't want me to throw them out there, but I want to say thank you to you all. By the way, your Rob Corps rings should be on their way. For our Honor Guard members of the Rob Corps, for these special patrons, your custom Rob Corps rings should be on their way. They're being shipped to me. After that, I will have them shipped to you. Stay tuned, keep your eye on Patreon and your messages, and you will hear about them coming to you. Thank you.